Before I formally start the meeting, I'll go to each committee member and confirm that they can hear and be heard. This is a legal requirement for me to do so. So if you could verbally confirm that you're able to hear me and I will <laughs> confirm in response that I can hear you. Where practicable, please also have your video switched on so that you can seen, be seen by other members in attendance and the public watching. Uh, Councillor Christy Balderson. Good morning, Chair. I can hear and see you. Thank you. Councillor Dave Bolter. Good morning, Chair. I can see and hear you. Thank you. Councillor Peter Ginman. Good morning, Chair and Committee. I can hear and see you. Councillor Diana Toynbee. Good morning, Chair. I can see you and hear you. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Yolande Watson. I... Not, not joined yet. Um, we'll come back to uh, Councillor Watson if she manages to join. Uh, I'd also like to request that the officers who will be present throughout the meeting can also hear that, confirm that they can hear and be heard. Um, Kate Charlton, Interim Head of Legal Services. Good morning, Chair. Yes, I can see and hear you. Thank you. Jackie Gooding uh, from the Southwest Audit Partnership. Good morning, Chair. Yes, I can see and hear you. Thank you. Andrew Lovegrove, our Chief Finance Officer. Uh, good morning, Chair. I can see and hear you. Uh, Amy Probert from the South West Audit Partnership. Um, Amy's given a yeah, um, yeah, Sorry, Amy's not joining us this morning. Thank you. Um, Caroline Marshall, Clerk to the Committee. Yes, Chair, I can hear and see you. Jen Priest, Technical Support. Yes, Chair, I can hear and see you. Uh, is Gail uh, Turner Radcliffe from Grant Thornton here? Good morning, Chair. Yes, I can confirm I can yes. see and hear you. Thank you. And Claire Ward, our Solicitor of the Council. Good morning, all. I can confirm I can hear and see you. And just pop back to Councillor Yolande Watson. Can you hear and see us? See yes, me? good morning, Chair. I can hear you and see you. I'm sorry I'm late. I had difficulties, um, you know, with internet. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we, we do have other offices in attendance for, for items on the agenda um, and also I'd like to welcome uh, Councillor Davis um, who's uh, 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 attending the meeting and uh, uh, hopefully uh, she'll be able to uh, uh, join us in some discussion on, uh, on the item on uh, procurement uh, later on in the meeting. Um, so without further ado, um let's uh go forward um the council is to video and audio stream this meeting live on the internet and making an official recording the recording forms part of the public record of the meeting and will be available on the council's website please note while it is only a legal requirement that you have your audio switched on it is the council's preference that way you're able to do so you also have video switched on please remember what you say and do in this meeting has a global reach and your words and actions should be chosen carefully can I also remind members to ensure they're wearing their headsets while listening, speaking during the meeting. This ensures the audio quality is the highest possible and the background noise is uh, significantly reduced. As these are extraordinary circumstances, there are some additional points for members and officers to be aware of. As part of our meeting etiquette in line with our normal committee practices, all microphones apart from mine will be placed on mute at the start and during the meeting. I will run through the agenda in the customary way. When you wish to speak, please raise your virtual hand. I'll then invite you to speak in order the hands being raised. Please remember to unmute yourself to speak and to mute yourself when you have finished. Please do not raise your physical hands. I do not want to miss anyone who may wish to speak. Please note the chat facility has been switched off to ensure that members' contributions can be offered through the spoken voice and for the public record. Please ensure all mobile devices are switched off to prevent interference with the audio and video systems. If any attendee loses connection, the meeting will be paused to ascertain if the connection can be restored quickly. If it is not possible to recover the connection within a reasonable amount of time, the meeting will continue as long as the quorum of committee members remains able to hear the proceedings and be heard. If you plan to leave before the end of the meeting, please can you indicate this in advance. Voting we undertaken electronically using the voting software within the virtual meeting platform. Only committee members may vote. And during that time, officers will be placed in the waiting room. In the event that electronic voting is not possible to use or there's a technology failure, I'll ask each committee member by means of a roll call to indicate if they are for or against or abstaining. The results of that roll call will only be recorded in the minutes of the meeting where there is a requirement to do so. Are there any questions about the procedures before we continue? 
Thank you. I'll now formally open the meeting. Uh, agenda item one, apologies for absence, Caroline. Caroline? Um, I have apologies for absence from Councillor Bob Matthews. Thank you, uh, noted. Uh, agenda item two, any named substitutions? There are no named substitutions, Chair. Thank you. Agenda item three, declarations of interest. Are there any uh, schedule one, schedule two or other interests to be declared on the agenda today? No. Agenda item four, minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, no matters of accuracy have been uh, notified to the monitoring officer. Uh, could committee members please cast your vote either for, against or abstain? And if I could ask Caroline to uh, bring a voting uh, form up. Chair, we have six voting members. Uh, the non-voting members are just being moved out. Just bear with. Those have been approved unanimously, Chair. Thank you for that. I'll just ask you to bring um, the non-voting members of the committee back in. Sorry, Councillor Jinman, you, you've got your hand up. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, when we approve the minutes, there are within the minutes, there's quite a few things where there are actions. Um, how are we ensuring these actions are actually happening? Because I can't quite, I was trying to look for a follow up to see how I know that a briefing has been provided or a, a further report has been done uh, that lies within that. And I'm not clear that there's a mechanism in there that shows. Thank you for that. Yes, there is, there should be a, uh, an action sheet. I think it's on page 19 of the report, but um, if the clerk wants to correct me, I'll be happy to be corrected. There should be an action tracker attached to the minutes. It will be after the public questions and answers that were attached to the minute. So it should be the third document in that section, Councillor Jinman. Chair, I didn't see it in the in the reporting pack. If uh, if the clerk could potentially uh, identify the page number, that would be helpful. Yes, if, if it's the one I think it is, then I did look oh. at that and I compared that to page 19. I did compare that with some of the actions that were in the preceding amount, uh, preceding minutes. And it, I still was unclear as to how we were being presented or if we're not being presented with it, who is being presented when we say a report will be prepared. So, for example, in the minutes, it says a report will be prepared on um, Ash Dieback. Uh, fine. Where has that where has that gone to, and how do we know it's happened, and to whom is it presented that it that it's then done? That that I'm just trying to tie it together, and I was having a, a bit of a difficulty following it. Uh, if I may, chair, uh, a brief a briefing note on Ash Dieback was circulated to all committee members on either the third or second of December, twenty twenty. And that's published in for the public to see as well, I presume, then, because obviously this is all public. Uh, no, that was a briefing note that was requested. So hence the reason it's only gone to members of the committee. The same for, okay. the, for the one in connection with flood resilience. Uh, 
the point being made, uh, I suppose, is where where is where the record is of those notes going out, other than in the um, excellent memory of the uh, clerk to the committee. Uh, where is that picked up? We we don't, that, that's not picked up in any documentation before us, is it? Perhaps I could leave that as a as a an action on the clock just to um, come back to confirm to us where those those actions are 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 collated at this time. Is that is that acceptable, Caroline? Yeah, with committee members, Councillor Ginman. Yeah, no, thank you. I, yeah. that, that I think is. I, uh, I think points well made. So that we don't uh, lose sight of uh, any uh, any activity. Um, right. So um, agenda items five and six, I'll take together the questions from members of the public or questions from councillors, and I understand uh, that there are no questions. Is that, is that correct? That's correct, Chair. Thank you. Um, and with committee's indulgence, I shall take agenda item eight prior uh, the proposed revised internal audit plan prior to the external audit progress report. Um, is committee content with that? Nod nodding of heads or thumbs up is fine. Thank you. So let's move to um, propose, uh, proposed revised internal audit plan 2020-21. Uh, I think our presenting officers, uh, Jackie Gooding uh, and uh, Amy Probert. Um, the purpose of this, uh, just to remind committee members and for any public listening, is to be assured that the level and range of activity within the proposed revised annual internal audit plan is sufficient to provide assurance over the council's corporate governance arrangements and provides appropriate coverage of key business activities, associated risks and risk management processes. Um, Jackie, would you like to present your report? Um, thank you, Chair. Good morning, members. Um, so this is the Internal Audit Activity Plan Progress Report. Um, it was written on at the 16th of December. So since my last report, 11 audits have been completed. Um, and these are detailed on pages 64 and 65 of the reports. And 14 audits are currently in progress. For the audits completed, there were two priority two findings one for staff car parking business permits, and one for emergency decisions. And both the priority two actions have been agreed with timescales of the 31st of December 2020 and the 31st of April 2021 for completion. The detail of the agreed actions are on pages 66 to 69 of the report. On page 71, I have highlighted the recent cross-comparison work um, for the Workforce Development Audit, which was requested by the Director of Adults and Communities. And the summary of the cross-comparison work has been shared with the Director for Adults and Communities. Pages 72 to 74 summarise the audit opinions and the number of recommendations that have been assessed and given to the audits completed to date. Page 13 of the report is a summary of additional work that has been requested since my last report to the committee in November. These audits have been included in the plan. On page 76, I wanted to draw the committee's attention to the proposed revised approach to planning. As you're aware, we normally take an annual plan or we'll bring an annual plan to the committee in March. The last 10 months has been dominated by the impact of COVID-19. And the annual plan for 2021-2021 looks very different now to the plan that was presented to the committee in March 2020. SWAP is proposing to move to a quarterly planning, which should provide a more flexible and agile approach. Each quarter plan will be discussed with relevant officers 
the management board and the chief finance officer prior to presenting to yourselves at the committee meeting. It is inevitable that the focus for the first quarter plan will be to revisit the auditable activities removed from the 2020-21 plan, as well as considering any key risk or emerging risk that we discuss with management. The proposal is to bring the first quarter plan report to the committee for its March meeting. Chair, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jackie. Um... Looking to the committee, uh, are there questions coming forward? I don't see any hands raised at the moment. Any questions? Everybody, everybody happy with 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 what's proposed there. Um, just looking at the um, two um, level two findings, um, Jackie, I, w I wonder if you could just give us a, an indication of the uh, uh, financial quantum uh, involved with those, whether that's um, uh, uh, just to, so that we can understand um, uh, what sort of sums of money are involved. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I can't really give you an indication of the, the quantum in relation to, to monetary value. Um, they are um, both findings that are in relation to um, the processes in place or, um, for those, um, sorry, for the findings. Um, and we didn't actually assess the financial value. Okay. Um, it's more about the risk of, of what could happen if the um, action is not put in place. We have an officer present, I believe, that, that that's um, that's involved with the um, uh, area under um, that was that was audited. Um, is that um, Mr? I'm trying to read my my scribbles here, uh, Mr. Such, is it? Mr. Smith. 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 I, I do beg your pardon. <laughs> I do beg your pardon, Paul Smith. Um, in, in term, from 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 an officer viewpoint, um, what were the issues that uh, were raised by the uh, by the audit, and 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 how do you intend uh, that uh, uh, officers deal with them? Good morning, Chair. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to Found you now. The, yep. <laughs> um, the the two issues were raised um, by the auditor were two uh, procurements of PPE that were done under the emergency procedures. Uh, there were a very large number, approximately 20, I believe, that were undertaken at the height of the pandemic. Uh, two emergency procurements were deemed to have payments have been made um, and the invoice couldn't be located. So the action is to speak to the providers of those particular products and to obtain a secondary copy of the invoice. Um, there's, there's, there's no question that the, uh, the procurement and the expenditure was in line with um, requirements, but there appears to be two invoices missing, then we will obtain those two invoices uh, to satisfy the findings of the audit committee and also the, the external auditors. I have had the chance to ex uh, uh, discuss this at length with the auditors uh, and we agreed that and we, and we felt that that was an appropriate response to these particular uh, issues. Thank you. To your knowledge, have those invoices yet been received? Uh, they haven't yet. Uh, we, will, we will expedite those and we will uh, commit to getting those within the calendar month. And what sort of quantum financial quantum is involved? Uh, unfortunately, I don't know because I've not been given that information. Right. Thank you. Uh, any other committee members want to ask questions of Mr. Smith? No. Um, in terms of um, the car parking, I think Mr. Hughes is also present. Um, Mr. Hughes, do you want to, to comment on the internal audit findings? Um, yes, so this um, principally related to um, the recording process of, of um, business permits, which are issued to uh, council staff for uh, parking one that whilst they're on council business. Um, so the, the audit found that the business world system that we're using at the moment 
uh, probably isn't the, the best suite that we could use um, to track and record uh, these permits. Uh, for example, it didn't um, it doesn't record um, live permits. So where where permits expire, uh, the the reporting within business world do, uh, requires a, a degree of manipulation to obtain that information. So we've proposed that we uh, switch the um, uh, the the issue of these permits onto a bespoke system that which we already hold for issuing resident permits, uh, so that to uh, to enable better oversight. Thank you. Uh, any questions from committee? No, right. Well, we'll uh, thank thank uh, officers for attending and um, move on. Oh no, we'll um, just go through to the recommendation. Um, we've reviewed the progress report attached at Appendix A. Um, sorry. I'm reading the wrong <coughs> recommendation. We uh, confirm that the proposed revised internal audit plan 2020-21 is reviewed and the committee determines any recommendations it wishes to be made regarding the level and range of activities proposed in order that the work carried out may give a satisfactory level of assurance over the council's corporate governance arrangements. I'm taking it that there are no rec further recommendations from committee. Uh, in which case, uh, can I ask that the uh, recommendation be put Six voting members, Chair, just moving out the non-voting members. Yeah, for some reason, my poll doesn't seem to be working. Uh, Councillor Balderson, are you able to click on the polls button at the bottom of your screen? It's on my screen. I've uh, clicked and hit submit, but it hasn't. Okay. It's, I've now got a failed to submit poll error, so I'll just try again. I'll um, relaunch the oh, poll uh, if you're happy. Oh, no, I've just, it's just, it's, I think it's just worked. I have the same problem. I'm showing failed to submit poll. Error 5003. Just waiting on the one vote, actually, Chair, so that's probably it. What, how would you like to proceed? Um, ah, all votes are in. Right. And right. unanimously accepted, Chair. Okay, thank you. If you could bring uh, non voting people back in. Thank you to those who are in the waiting room. Um, that recommendation was approved. And we shall now move to agenda back to agenda item seven, the external audit progress report. Um, and uh, I've got presenting officers as Sir uh, John Roberts and Gail Turner Radcliffe from Grant Thornton. Uh, and just to remind committee members and public. Uh, the purpose of this is to provide the committee with a progress report of the work being undertaken by external audit. Uh, our external auditor being Grant Thornton. Um, so uh, I assume it's over to you, John, for Yes, thank, update. Thank, thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'll take you through this report, which um, importantly is uh, an interim um, audit findings report. The committee will, at its next uh, meeting, receive our full and final uh, report. Um, so uh, I think it's important that we, you know, we we'll treat this for purely for, for information. It is a it is a point in time. Um, we'll also take questions at the end. Um, Gail Gail is is here through a uh, a very thick cold this morning, so uh, so I'll do, try and do most of the talking uh, to save her voice. Um, 
As I say, it's an interim findings report. This year's audit has been highly unusual given the uh, the COVID circumstances. Um, the entire audit has been conducted through lockdown. So not only has the you know the council's operations been um, quite rightly div diverted and uh, into um, priorities of, of responding to COVID, um, but um, the audit team and the council finance team have had to cope with um, with undertaking this audit work not being in the same uh, physical location. Which is, um, if you'd asked me beforehand, was that going to be possible? I, I would have um, been extremely sceptical. Uh, but we have got there. We have developed over the course of the pandemic. We've developed our um, abilities to exchange securely uh, documentation, uh, to undertake the audit work that we need to do, to raise queries and to challenge officers on the areas of the audit. Um, and that's important that, that there is a difference when it when it comes to rem remote work in that that's actual challenge work that we have to do. We have to have an extra level of, of care in it because because of the, because of the fact that we're not actually in in the same location um and, and we are able to obviously communicate through through the, this source of um of, of video uh, communications links as well um and, and we are getting there we are getting to, to the very end of the audit the um the work has taken longer as it's a consequence certainly i, I would have been skeptical of whether it was possible what well, it is possible but it does take longer it takes it takes quite a bit longer to do the secretary of state had given uh, an extension of the end of november um for local authorities but only across the country only 45 percent of local authorities actually made made that date with their auditors uh, and that gives you an indication of the um, the the challenge of of, um, of auditing along these ways. I, actually, I, I think we we would have possibly got there or, or very close to there um, had not the the council had an issue that it needed to investigate, and and our work has been sort of um, held back. Really, is the best way to describe it. While the council has, has progressed those investigations, they have a bearing on um, one of our value for money risks, as as we set out in the report on on the capital program. Um, but also um, that that might have a, an issue um, around the um, the accounting areas as well. Um, but we're we're almost there. The um, the report sets out a list of outstanding matters. That's on page twenty eight. Now that list is coming down all the time. It's it's actually the amount of work behind those those bullet points on page twenty eight are um, it's quite um, specific and and contained. So. Um, uh, we are we are ready. I, I would say within within the next couple of weeks we would be we would be ready to um, to give our opinion on the financial statement. Um, we anticipate that that will be an unqualified opinion. That that work has has gone well, although we we still have to finish uh, finish work. There there will be some adjustments to the accounts. Um, There'll be so we've already identified some that that aren't reflected in this report. There there might be further further ones as we as we come to um, as we come to finalise this. I'm not not anticipating that any further matters will be um, anything more than disclosures. But um, but but we we will report very clearly to the committee uh, what that outcome is um, at the next uh, meeting when we actually are ready to give our audit uh, opinions and conclusions. On the value for money work, we'd identified three risks as i say the, the capital program risk is is the one that we're we're waiting for the council to uh, undertake its work on uh, the other two risks on on financial sustainability and on um governance corporate governance we were we were satisfied with that there was um, there was no um, no findings of, of criticisms uh within those areas so we continue we continue to work work on the audit and we will come back with um with a build on this report um at the next meeting i'm fully expectant that we will be able to finish the the audit certainly our audit opinion work will, will be done and dusted by then we would hope that the value for money work could be concluded then as well but that is um subject to the council's work uh, being uh, being concluded in that area i'm happy to take questions Joe. Uh, thank you, John. Um, committee uh, questions? Uh, Councillor Balderson. Thanks, Chair. Um, uh, my, I've got two questions just around um, the headline. So um, thank you for that 
for that report. Um, first one is around uh, the statutory duties. So um, I understand from your report the, that hopefully you will be concluding in the next few weeks. So I just wanted to understand whether we're any closer to, to, to getting this element sorted and whether you'd be able to certify the closure of the audit. Uh, and then secondly, around the value for money um, and the elements around the capital program, um, my understanding is essentially the decision around the bypass on the 2nd of February at full council. I just wanted to get a better understanding of what implications this will have um, depending on, on what the decision was. So just those two elements on, on your headlines, mm. uh, Mr. Roberts. Yeah, perhaps it's, it's more appropriate for Mr. Levgrove to give first response and, I, and I'll talk to the audit aspects then from that. Judge, I'm very happy to do that. In terms of the uh, decision, well, the council meeting on the 2nd of February and the papers have been published and we can see um, what is being asked is a decision about progressing or not progressing the two road schemes on there. Uh, the papers are quite clear about the implications of that and what is being proposed is a movement from reserves to decapitalise them if the view of council is to, to not proceed. So I, I'm not sure that's a specific value for money issue. Um, clearly, um, Grant Thornton will look at that in the round uh, on there because it is a um, significant uh, item in our capital programme on there. In terms of the specifics of the value for money uh, work that's ongoing, as, as John Roberts has said, uh, we are carrying out an investigation into a certain aspect of um, process, which has um, just about concluded from the officer side. Uh, we now need to understand the next steps from that investigation so that that is being considered at an officer level. Um, uh, that, that should uh, move into the next phase once we've decided what the next phase is. Uh, we're keeping Grant Thornton abreast of this, but uh, clearly we need to conclude that to enable them to form their conclusion. If, if you can recall back the value for money um, conclusion issued by Grant Thornton last year was very clear about their concerns and um, we are working on those and looking at those and a number of changes have been made into process how we deal with the capital program. Uh, th those are taking um, time to embed and make changes into the culture and the processes on there. So that, that is very much work in progress. There is one other quite long standing um, matter that's uh, required the audit to uh, be uh, to have the certificate withheld for I think probably the last three years. I'm not anticipating that that uh, specific issue will be concluded in uh, in time for us to release the final certificate um, by by March. But but as I say, we, we should be in a position to give our value for money conclusion. Um, the council's decision on the bypass um, and as Mr. Lovego said, treatment of, of reserves etc is clearly outside the financial year uh, that, that our audit opinion uh, will be reflecting on, um, but it is uh, potentially a post-balance sheet event. So as a post-balance sheet event, we would need to consider uh, the conditions of, was it an adjusting or non-adjusting? So did it relate to factors uh, present at the uh, balance sheet date, which feels unlikely. Um, even if it's a non-adjusting post-balance sheet event, we still uh, have expectations around disclosures around that as, as a as post-balance sheet event. And that, that's one of those um, disclosure issues that, that I was anticipating would, would still need to be considered in, in this year's accounts. Thank you, John. Uh, Councillor Balderson, is that... Um answer your queries. Thank you. Uh, anybody else got any questions? Councillor Jinman. Yes, thank you. Um, on page nine of your report, it's um, risk identified aud auditor commentary. Can you just remind me what the McLeod position is? Um, I'm sort of going, I'm sure I should know that, but I don't instantly recall it. So what does it refer to? And the second thing is that in two places in this report, there's the uh, pension reference, which says it's all ongoing. Now, given liability on pensions is one of the major concerns for many businesses, I just wonder whether we've got a sign of a sight of when that's going to actually um, uh, be reviewable by yourselves. I'm pretty sure that's that's come to 
that that's that's progressed well that's one of those those things on our list uh, that had progressed well um we just needed to put our resources into reviewing it i don't think there's any more further that the council needs to provide and i'm pretty sure also that the uh, um Worcestershire pension fund is is um work is work is completed as well but gail can can input on that mcleod was um one of those things that that comes up from time to time uh, last year it was a case um that had uh, gone against the uh, the government it was challenged by the um judges uh, pension scheme um on grounds of um age discrimination i believe it was sex and age discrimination uh, and so as a result changes to that pension scheme uh, had an impact on the assessment of liability um, that also was deemed to apply to the local government pension scheme so it's been one of those things that was raised last year progress has been made at a government level to um, resolve that this year but it's been one of those technical um pensions matters that we've need to, to follow through and that's entirely consistent across the whole of the country. Gail, do you want to come in just on the, the detail of the IS-19? Thanks, John. So um, with the, the pension fund, as John said, when we had um, the resources to do the audit, we, um, uh, as part of the audit, we challenged the actuary on some of the figures within the IS-19 report. Um, and we've now received that work, so we're currently going through. Um, we don't think there's anything more we'll need from the actuary or the council. We just need to complete our documentation um, around that process. Thank you, Councillor Jinman. Does that uh, answer your queries? Yes, I suppose the only thing I'm seeking is the timeline for when that might be completed so we can be assured it, it's um, pension liabilities are such a concern to most businesses most enterprises uh, it's something which um, it would be encouraging and given the current fluctuations obviously in markets uh, there is going to be a sort of added concern that work is, is well well under control councillor yes i can give give you assurances there there's there'd be no problem completing that work by um by the, by the March committee meeting. There, there is, it's a, it's a good point well made though around volatility and what I should have said in my introduction is consistent again with the national position. Um, there was material valuation uncertainty present at the 31st of March and remember these are accounts at the 31st of March last year as COVID hit. Um, the uh, Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors issued a communication to its members saying that they expected there to be material uh, uncertainty around property valuation. So that's reflected in our um, audit opinion as an emphasis of matter, uh, referring to that uncertainty, uh, but also drawing attention to the uncertainty around the um, property that the pension fund, the valuation of the property that the pension fund owns as well. Thank you for that. Uh, any further questions? <coughs> if uh, Councillor Balderson again. Thanks, Chair. I just have one last question um, on um, act, the action plan. Um, so page uh, 26 of the report or 50 of the reporting pack uh, around journal authorization. Um, I note that it's been outstanding um, for a little while. Um, so I just wanted to get a little bit more clarity around it as to where, and this might be a, a question for um, Mr. Lovegrove, but um, is it a case that the journals don't have appropriate authorization? or they're not just being, they're just not being signed off electronically. Um, so just trying to ascertain that element. And then secondly, uh, the management response is that we will reconsider this recommendation. So um, I just wanted to understand if uh, controls within business world are going to be implemented or whether you're looking at other ways to, um, to resolve this action plan. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I notice we've put in the response. We have other controls that are outside of business world, uh, which help us control this um, matter. Uh, business world, uh, there's a configuration issue and a resourcing issue about how we delegate. So it's one of the things that we've uh, undertaken to have a look at whether we can configure uh, business world to deliver this control within the system or whether we continue to use the um, 
controls outside of the system. Uh, so that's something we're evaluating and talking to um, uh, technical support in terms of business world. But it's, it's a point well made on that. Um, and it's part of uh, trying to balance the, the amount of resource that we put into this. I mean, we could build another layer of, of checks into the system, but that has quite a staff resource implication. So it is trying to get that balance um, right in terms of and get to the right level. So my understanding, so it's currently listed as a medium assessment. So I guess this is probably a question now for you, Mr. Roberts. If if there are, um, from Mr. Lovegrove, controls in place, um, it, it, I'm just trying to understand why you've, you've listed it as a medium assessment and, and potentially um, not a low uh, mm. I think what, what's what's driving that the if there were if there were no controls in place I would have put that as high because it's it's um, it's attached to uh, a significant risk journals is probably uh, the most um, area of, of uh, uh, any organisation's accounts where you can affect manipulation of the accounting totals. Um, through manual intervention and, and what's called management override. Um, so it's, um, it's what's uh, an expected significant risk across all audits, whether, whether they're company audits or public sector audits. So it's a, it's a very high um, inherent pri priority for auditors uh, and regulators treat it as a, as a very important part of, of audit work as well. So the prioritization is, is, is driven by the fact that yes, we, we accept the fact that the council does have controls in place um, we will, and we think it's our role to still bring it to your attention each year, as as long as that point is because of its inherent importance. Thank you. Councillor Shaw. Thank you, pardon, Councillor Ginman. <laughs> I was going to say, I can see your lips moving, but I wondered. Um, it, it, it would seem wrong not to seize this opportunity, John, while we've got you on, on the, uh, uh, in front of us. You'll be aware of the Times article, no doubt. You'll be aware of the uh, comments from the FRC. And um, the, on the back of the sort of Redmond report that said local uh, authority accounts are impenetrable to the public. I mean, are we... Are we, uh, you know, seeking the reassurances and asking the questions we are doing? Obviously, this still does open up a question as to the uh, the value and whether or not we're we're getting things presented in ways which will allow us to take this forward. Is there anything that you internally, in view of those comments and reports, are now finding yourself thinking we ought to be doing when we're presenting this? Mm. Uh, yes, and uh, it's really, really, you know, good comment, observation about what's going on in, in local audit. So, um, funnily enough, the meeting I was at before this one was talking to the MHCLG implementation team on Redmond. So we are continuing to um, to discuss with, with governance, uh, government how uh, matters can be taken forward. The you will have seen the FRC report, which I think was covered by the Times about audit quality scores and across you know, virtually all of the audit firms, uh, the FRC uh, highlighted and it was top of its priority list, auditors needing to do more work around property plant and equipment. Um, and we have been doing more work around property plant and equipment. Um, we uh, spend probably more time on, on our audits doing that and doing pensions work uh, because they've been highlighted by the regulator in the past as, as um, the significant areas for improvement. It's part of a, a work in process. We absolutely take uh, the FRC's um, findings and recommendations 100% seriously and have been devoting a huge amount of, uh, of, of time and resource into doing that. Um, that uh, sort of raising the quality bar is, um, is consistent with what's been going on in the corporate space as well, following the, the big corporate uh, failures. And, and I presented to the committee about the Redmond review and the context of, of it all and sort of ex explained all of that. You know, you don't change the, um, 
the audit work overnight. Uh, you don't change the, the depth that local authorities go in to support their, their property valuations and their pensions valuations overnight. It takes time. So, so we are on that journey. We'd expect to see our quality scores reflected more positively in next year's um, FRC as a result of all the um, investment we've been putting in there. The issue then that government in its response to the Redmond review is looking at is, 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 the, is that the right direction of travel? And, and we, are, um, we are dependent on, on government's, uh, government's sort of response to Redmond there really, because Redmond has, has quite, um, quite clearly identified that from the local authority sector, it would want auditors uh, spending their time and their, their concentration on things like commercial investments, where there's a risk that those could go wrong, um, on things like the, the value for money and the underlying financial sustainability of organisations, of the um, organisations' reliance on on groups uh, and sort of companies that might and sometimes do fail. And we've seen some quite, you know, sort of high profile ones there recently where where our audit firm has, um, has reported publicly um, around that. So so that's the, uh, you know, that's the big debate at the moment going on in, in the uh, in the response to Redmond is how can we take things forward in a meaningful way that will keep all the parties um, satisfied that it's the it's the right it's the right direction for local audit to be going. So, thank you. Um, I mean, clearly that there's a fair level of criticism in all of those reports and comments. And from our point of view, um, Chair, I suppose we need to ensure that changes that are mooted are ones that we can see being adopted. So I suppose we need a sort of regular report of how these changes and these thoughts are uh, the criticisms are being tackled and brought into actively uh, ensuring that our audit meets the requirements. In, indeed, Councillor Jimlin, um, and we'd, we'd look to uh, uh, external audit and, and to our 151 officer um, to, uh, to comment on these um, as they come forward. Um, Staying on that investment property, I, I did have a question um, on referring to page 37 of our pack, I think page 13 of the, the report, um, dealing with investment property totals, um, land and building other. There's a comment there, we've challenged management about their treatment of the waste plant. Um, I just wondered if you, you could expand on that a bit. Um, the financial responsibility or the responsibility for the financial management of the waste plant uh, lies within the audit governance committee. And I was just conscious of that comment and uh, wondered if mm. you were able to expand. Yes. Uh, and that's one where clearly that, you know, the, the, your accounts, the accounting treatment has to be, you have to be comfortable with the accounting treatment there, but the waste plant is, is still through um, Worcestershire Council, and um, the auditors of, of Worcestershire have also been been challenging that, and we've we've been um, taking a consistent approach to the to the audit challenge there. Um, Gail, can you refresh refresh the detail? Thanks, John. Um, so in this case, um, the the waste plant hadn't been revalued in you. So what we, we were challenging management on was how was they certain that the value that was included in the accounts was the correct value if they hadn't had the expert um, and, and lion valuation? Thank you. And, and, and what, what was the reply for that? There had been a lot of work done behind the scenes. Um, both um, independently in Hereford, but also um, the, the officers had been working um, with Worcestershire Council as well to, to um, jointly um, come up with a, a solution. A solution that satisfied you on the veracity of the valuation mm. of the plan. Yes. Yep. Yeah, and it, and it, you have to break down the component elements of it and sort of look at the you know the material figures and so on and, and doing that. And we and we were yeah. satisfied with that as was um, our counterpart audit team at, at Worcestershire County. Thank you. 
Um, I also noted on page 40 uh, of our pack, oh, pack um, a comment about the cash flow forecast being extended. I presume the extensions required by reason of the late uh, completion of the hmm. um, accounts. Yes, it's, that's, that's right. one of those. Yes, that's one of those points that, that for going concern, the cash flow statements an important part of, of a going concern assessment, and the standards require the going concern assessment, which is forward looking, to be um, to be good for the twelve months following the date of the audit, which is why those periods need to align. Date of the audit or date of the sign off. Audit, audit, audit sign off. Audit sign off. Right. Yeah. Right just to understand the reason mm -hmm. for that yeah okay thank you um any further questions on the external audit D do i have any recommendations from committee no uh we need to vote therefore that the progress update attached appendix a has been reviewed and the committee has determined any recommendations it wishes to make to ensure the value of the external audit work is maximized uh, if i could ask for the vote to be um, put six voting members again chair thank you Are all votes cast? I'm just waiting on two, Chair. I'm having the same issues as last time, Chair, with my voting buttons. I've got one outstanding now. Is it working now, Councillor Balderson? Yeah, it's it freezes for about 10 seconds and then it comes up with an error message and then it allows me to vote again. So it's just taking a little bit longer. Okay. Um, all, all votes are in, Chair. Those have been approved unanimously. Thank you. If we could bring everybody back in. Thank you um, for those that were in the waiting room. Uh, that uh, vote was um, passed. Uh, we can now move on to agenda item nine, the Rethinking Governance Working Group Progress Update. Um, I think uh, the purpose of this is to update the committee on the progress of the Rethinking Governance Working Group work. Um, and uh, John Coleman, our Democratic Services Manager, um, will uh, give us a, a presentation on this with comments, uh, I'm sure, from the chair of the working group, uh, Councillor Balderson. John? Yeah. Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, so um, hopefully all, all members of the committee have, have seen the reports and the appendices attached with the reports. Uh, just, just to recap on the, the, the founding principles of the, the rethinking governance work, it's designed to maximise member engagement and participation in decision making. Ensure decision making is informed, transparent and efficient. It's welcoming of public engagement, uh, enable uh, members and officers to perform effectively in their roles with defined functions and to assess any resource implications from the proposed, uh, from any proposed changes. Um, just to recap for the committee, back in September uh, 2020, um, the uh, recommendation to the Audit and Governance Committee was to move towards a hybrid model of governance, um, which uh, would allow for uh, potentially more um, member involvement in, in influencing decision making um, and looked at, uh, we'll, you know, looking at um, various components of the constitution to see what might need to change as a result of that. Following the agreement from full council in October uh, to move towards a hybrid cabinet model of governance, uh, the, the rethinking governance group 
have undertaken a number of focus group meetings. Um, so on the 8th of December, we met with the scrutiny committees. On the 22nd of December, we met with the planning and regulatory committee. We've met with group leaders on the 5th of January, audit and governance on the 8th of January, and we met with cabinet on the 14th of January. There have been a number of issues that have um, come out of those discussions. Um, we're looking currently at what possible changes may be required to scrutiny, both on a structural uh, front, but also to, in terms of working practices. Uh, if I was to try and summarise uh, some of the discussions, it's it's looking at moving um, scrutiny to be more influential in the pre-decision um, influencing and uh, phases of, of, of decision making. Um, We've also undertaken a number of surveys, uh, so planning uh, have, have had a survey done and members will be aware that there was a, a survey that was circulated. Uh, we're looking at the results of that as we speak and Councillor uh, Watson in particular has taken a, a clear leading role with that and we're, we're continuing to work uh, to look at what, what the results uh, have come from that. Uh, we're looking to meet with planning officers on the 15th of February. Um, we also uh, undertook some survey work with the scrutiny chairs and vice chairs and those survey results have come back in and we're looking at analysing those as well to see uh, and to explore uh, what uh, changes that they may be advocating around uh, scrutiny. Um, there have been a number of um, actions resulting and in the Appendix B of the uh, report, you, you will be able to see the current action tracker. Uh, more actions have been added to that since uh, publication following the Cabinet meeting. And we're currently reviewing those actions in terms of what implications they may have. Uh, broadly speaking, they'll fall into uh, two categories. Uh, one will be whether or not there are any constitutional changes required, uh, but also as well, we're looking at what operational changes uh, uh, are required as a result of the focus group discussions. Um, elements that we're looking at are making some uh, changes to the forward plan to improve um, how, how that looks and, and to try and bring more decisions onto the forward plan earlier with greater clarity around them. <clears throat> We're also looking at introducing scrutiny web pages. Um, we're also looking at um, what skills members have to ensure that we've got a clear understanding of what members skills uh, may be able to be brought to bear in different um, committee or uh, situations or circumstances. Uh, we're also planning a, a public uh, member of the public survey uh, to explore uh, what engagement um, they're, they're currently having with the council and how we can look to improve that engagement with the council and, and, and participation. Um, so I think, I think I'll stop there. There are, um, I'm sure, a number of questions that committee members may have. Thank you, John. Um, I don't know, uh, Councillor Balderson, did you want to add anything or, or shall I just open uh, to committee members for, for comment and questions. Thanks, Chair. No, I think um, John's covered off um, the fair amount of detail. I think just in, in terms of headlines, um, we are on track with progress as reported in, a, in Appendix 1. Um, we're expecting um, member consultation and, and public engagement um, to have commenced and to be substantially completed by the time we next report to the ANG in March. Um, and as John highlighted, Appendix 2 is, is a working document uh, and will change and evolve as we analyse all the information that's coming in. Um, and I guess a number of um, emerging uh, thoughts are that a lot of uh, the changes required for our working group to meet our guiding principles um, a lot of them revolve around operational and effectiveness changes. Uh, and over the next few weeks, um, the working group will be looking at um, the, the structure and, and solidifying some of our thoughts around that. But certainly um, making some operational changes will go a long way to achieving the, um, the guiding principles that were set out for us to achieve. Thank you. Um... So looking to members of the committee, anybody got some questions? Councillor Toynbee, I think, uh, is trying to attract I'm sorry, attention. Sorry, Chair. I, <laughs> That's I, right. I, I, normally I can find my blue hand and I couldn't. I'm, I'm very sorry. Um, <clears throat> yes, I, I just wanted to um, th thank um, John and, and Councillor Balderson for this. Um, it's really good to have an update. I think the... Um, from the point of view of the self-assessment of, of our committees and effectiveness, that's been a very useful 
possibly overdue process and um, another of these things where the process has been as useful as the actual um, product. So thank you and thank you for Councillor Balderson for sort of facilitating that for us. Um, I've just got a question on standing panels, which I might have missed something. I know that in the report that we've got, um, it comes under, standing panels come under the scrutiny heading. So it's about standing panels of scrutiny members. But um, I just wanted to know what the working group's doing about standing panels, broader standing panels. You know, some councils have standing panels of citizens. Um, so I just wanted to ask about that, like using the amazing sort of human capital in the county, how we're going to involve people. Uh, who would like to answer that? I'm happy to have a first stab if that's okay. Yes, thank you, John. Uh, so, so yes, we 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 have been exploring um, standing panels as part of the mix of discussions, certainly around scrutiny. Um, I, I think a, a broad theme of the discussions around scrutiny has been how do we open scrutiny up to a much greater um, influence from members of the public, but also expert witnesses that we have in the county. Uh, and I think uh, uh, underpinning that is, is not necessarily expertise in sort of technical areas, but expertise in life as well, to be able to ensure that, you know, the committees have uh, real world experiences to be able to bring to bear. Um, I, I think an interesting dimension of the discussion, uh, certainly with um, standing panels and task and finish groups uh, has been, um, the element that um, yes the principle is is certainly clear that um, task and finish groups and standing panels have a, a great potential to be able to you know influence decisions before perhaps cabinet or cabinet members take those decisions in helpful and, and constructive ways um, but then there is this um, uh, I, I suppose a, a, a tension that potentially exists about scrutiny committees making recommendations ahead of decisions being made and then the scrutiny committees then holding cabinet to account so we're, we're trying to uh, we're trying to work through that and, and, and explore ways in which you know the principle of getting much more um, I suppose policy and decision influence ahead of decisions being made um, uh, can can be developed while also retaining the uh, the element of scrutiny uh, that is is so important to local authorities, which is to be able to you know hold the executive to account. Um, so so yes, we're we're looking and exploring that uh, at the moment. It, it's uh, it's it's a bit of a head scratcher, but we we've got some ideas uh, that we're 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 sort of um, discussing. Um, but also, yes, I mean, that the principle of getting more expert witnesses, more members of the public to influence how scrutiny and decision making works in the authority is certainly something that we're trying to um, uh, hardwire into our, our thinking. Thank you. It's really good to know that you're exploring that. Thank you. Um, Councillor Bolter. Thank you. Next. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, my question really was on a point from Christy made earlier on. First of all, they're doing a great job. It's really hard work to get through. But we're now looking at public engagement. What do we mean by that exactly? Are we sending out surveys? Are we doing all sorts? Bear in mind that the public have been going through quite a lot of surveys from us recently. And the question would be is, from our, my point of view, how interested are they and what impact will it have on decision making? Good, good, good point. Well made. Um, I don't know. Uh, does Councillor Balderson or John, do you want to comment back on that? I'm happy to have a first first stab again. Um, so, so yeah, with, with with the public engagement, we're really trying to understand um, a little bit more about how members of the public currently engage and and what what um, how we can encourage them to engage more. You know, we're 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 looking particularly in, at, at areas around public questions at our committees. How do we how do we create a, a process that members of the public will want to engage with more? So there have been ideas uh, discussed around perhaps having a, a monthly Q and A session with with members of the cabinet or cabinet members. Um, also looking at the public question process, how could we improve that to make it a more interactive uh, and um, participative um, process for, for members of the public? So, so the, the survey that we're, we're looking at will, will be quite focused, really looking at how we can increase engagement and participation in, in local decision making. Uh, we, we know there are issues and problems with uh, the processes we have at the moment. So the public question process at the moment is described by members as being overly bureaucratic and they're, they're reflecting back with their, their experiences with members of uh, members of the public so we're, we're looking at ways in which we can make the we can improve the process and we can encourage more people to to get involved thank you, thank you for that um 
I don't know, uh, Councillor Bolton, did you want to add any anything? Uh, no, I, th I think a lot of people have challenged why we are consulting the public if we're doing a constitutional review. But um, the third guiding principle that the working group is working under is to welcome public engagement. So we felt like it was certainly something in order for us to fulfill all the elements that full council asked us to achieve is something that we, we needed to explore. Uh, and um, we've picked some of the key things out, um, which uh, John Coleman has, has outlined that we thought would be um, essential for us to cover off on in, in, in terms of um, achieving our objectives. Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Watson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'd like to just say, um, yeah, thanks ever so much to uh, Christy for, you know, her excellent chairing of the Rethinking Governance Working Group and my other colleagues. Um, and, um, you know, it, it's not to be underestimated how much work is actually involved behind the scenes. And, and, and we really do re rely on our democratic services our team as well of John and Caroline. Um, and, um, but yeah, um, and most public won't know that we're going to now be meeting every two weeks to ensure that we get things through. So we really are, um, you know, um, you know, working hard behind the scenes and um, but I think what's building on what uh, Councillor Bolter was just asking I think what we're going to try and do is to make the constitution more accessible and um, much more um, easily accessed um, and when we talk about engagement it's not just about down, you know, um, it's not just giving out information, it's also gathering information and ensuring that, you know, we are accountable and transparent. Um, and that goes to our guiding principles of what came out. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. Um, just to comment, uh, John, I, uh, I've, I've had it uh, raised that um, a, a link within the document, um, section 12, page 97 um, isn't isn't necessarily working so um, yeah. perhaps I could ask um, you just to check all all the links in the document uh, are functioning I know if 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 a member well if you know any of us look at a document and and and, and the link doesn't work it's it very um, uh, a bit exasperating so uh, yeah. uh, just if you could just double check that uh, for us um, I, I will do Councillor. Okay, sure. I, I I think the link you're referring to is to the um, newly developing um, scrutiny pages. Yes. Um, yeah. So um, th those pages have been developed um, very much in line with recommendations coming from the working group um, uh, deliberations. Uh, so we have developed some scrutiny web pages very much designed around uh, getting more public engagement and expert witnesses and, and so forth. So um, yeah. it's it currently not a live link, um, but I'll explore what issues uh, are, are making it yeah. uh, go to a dead link at the moment. Yeah. Uh, well, even even a holding page saying, you know, uh, with a date and, and saying currently a dead link, um, you know, but, but yeah. do 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 come back later sort of thing. Yeah, no, thank, would, thank would, you would for be appreciated. It. Uh, yeah. I think it's very good. I, I, I'm fully appreciating as well that um, uh, the, the, this whole uh, area is, 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 you know, is being moved on very quickly. And uh, mm. uh, I was about to say astonishingly um, uh, to uh, to time scale um, to time um, because. Uh, I've no underestimate, you know, uh, I cannot underestimate what, what a huge uh, piece of work it is. It, it, it is significant and uh, 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 comprehensive and far reaching. Um, Councillor Ginman, you've got your hand up. Yeah, thank you for picking up on the link item, which uh, I was just going to raise if you hadn't. The second real point was that looking at this, am I right in saying that the constitutional changes here are not as binding as if the council had done a wholesale change or does a wholesale change from a uh, committee system or to a committee system in a broader sense. So that where there are changes being suggested, these are ones that could be reversed, changed, altered in the event of uh, finding they're not quite as successful as they first thought to be. Whereas the 
original or suggested intent of a wholesale change would have bound us in for five years, I think, or something like that. I, I, am I right in thinking that? Uh, yes, Councillor Jinman, that, that, that's my understanding, that if we if we had um, uh, said at full council that we were going to go to a committee system, that would have bound us in for a, a set period of time. I, I believe it is five years. Um, the, the arrangement that we're working with at the moment is looking very much about how we can improve current systems. Um, so what's what's been talked about are, you know, considerations of perhaps subcommittees of, of cabinet, um, strengthening the work of task and finish groups, um, and, and looking at possibly standing panels. So some of the constitutional changes uh, that are being considered are, are naturally around existing structures and, and how we can look to improve those with, with those uh, potential options. So, um, so yes. Thank you, Councillor Balderson. And one further thing I just wanted to add to that as well, Councillor Jinman, is, is there is a 12 month review um, built into our work programme uh, so, as many of our recommendations may be operational, we can put them into operation, assess them, see how they're working, and uh, when we get to the, the one year anniversary, we can then um, do a review to see whether they actually achieve the outcomes that we intended them to achieve. And if not, within this system, we then do have the opportunity to, to make further tweaks if necessary. So, it's a much more... Um, uh, user friendly or we can we can get to the to the ends in a, in a much easier way than if we did a wholesale change to the committee structure that, thank you for the answer to that uh, can i just pick up on one other point that was just raised a moment ago and that was about the use of the public and also it was put together with the use of experts um i'm presuming that those are being looked at as two separate entities um, because the selection of experts and indeed the payment of experts, I think is something that does need to be carefully considered as to how that, how that comes about, how that achieves, how it meets Nolan principles, or if not Nolan uh, in, it, um, in its purest form, but at least is following that, those, that, those sorts of lines. So I'm, I'm assuming those are now two separate areas of concern. Would somebody like to come back on that? John? Yeah, yes, I mean, certainly we, we, we are looking at that very carefully. Um, you know, certainly with expert witnesses and any co-option onto committees, we're, we're framing that around um, you know, protocol documents. We're also uh, currently within our constitution, we, we make provision for, um, you know, payment to expert witnesses and ensuring that, um, you know, the, the, the Nolan principles are, are, are adhered to. You will be aware that um, government has changed a little bit how it does it, whereas it used to have public appointments as open. They are now using a sort of secondary system and adopting Nolan but not necessarily putting it into the public uh, review or public advertisement type. And it's a sort of um, a filtered system, I think is how I would put it, but it's something perhaps just to consider. That, that's really helpful, Councillor Jim, and I'd, I'd, I'd welcome sight of that. If you can point me in the right direction, uh, if, I, if I can review that, that would be really helpful. Thank you for that. So um, if no further questions. Um, in terms of recommendations, can we um, welcome the uh, report and uh, compliment the uh, working party on its, uh, on its uh, work so far and look forward to um, further report um, at its due, due date, which is, um, at, is it at the next meeting? March, I believe. March, at the March meeting, March. thank you. Um, if we could just, uh, unless there are any other recommendations from committee, no, nope. um, perhaps we could just vote on that then and uh, then move on to the next item. Thank you, Chair. We've still got six voting members, um, just waiting for non-voting members to leave.
So interesting, I've got a fail to submit poll error 5003 now as well. 5003. Yeah, uh, it's gone again. Right, this is, this is fine. Not to be left out, Chair. I will do some research, Chair. Um, those um, recommendations have been approved unanimously. Thank you. Um, if we can bring people back in from the waiting room. We're now going to take um, agenda item 10, the anti-fraud and corruption annual report. Um, I am thinking perhaps to have a five minute uh, break at the end of this um, agenda item, if, if, if committee is in agreement. And, um, and then we'll come back uh, to the, uh, the final items on the agenda. So if everybody's back in, um, agenda item 10, the anti-fraud and corruption annual report. Um, the presenting officer will be Jonathan Nelson, the county, county the counter fraud specialist. Uh, just to remind committee members and any public listening, the purpose of this is to for the report to consult the committee on the proposed updated counter fraud and corruption strategy 2021-24 and to give an annual report on the key risks within the council and how these are being addressed or managed. Um, so if I could pass to um, Mr Nelson and ask him to just present his uh, uh, report and to welcome him to uh, uh, to the committee. I think it's the first time you've you've been with us um, since your appointment uh, uh, earlier last year. Yeah. Good. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's nice to to meet everyone, even if it's virtually. I've now I've met a few people in here, uh, but I joined in April 2020 as we were going into the first national lockdown. So um, as I'm sure you'll imagine that the position has very much been prioritising COVID. 19 uh, fraud risks um, uh, alongside uh, supporting local businesses at the, during this time. Um, so, yeah, as, as just mentioned, the report that's presented to you from page uh, 103 onwards, um, the purpose of that is to very much report on what we've uh, been focusing on, what we've been doing um, over the, uh, the last 10 months, um, and also to give you some sort of assurance on the, um, the levels of um, verification work that's been undertaken on the business support grants. Um, so the, the report very much begins on the approach that the council wishes to take, and that is the zero tolerance approach to fraud, corruption and bribery. Um, where we've identified fraud, we take relevant lawful um, actions um, uh, in pursuit of recovery of losses and public funds and to, uh, and to take necessary actions against um, those identified to be committing the offences. Um, so we have noticed uh, a national increase in fraud um, and cybercrime over the last decade, but in specific, um, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, it's created new opportunities for fraud, um, remote working, new processes, new policies, um, uh, very much mean that the risk of fraud is at a heightened level um, across um, across the organisation, but also across um, the UK as a whole. Um, so if I further go on to discuss the um, the work that's been undertaken at point six um, on page 104, you can see we've um, got the um, level of fraud, error and non-compliance that we've undertaken verification work on. Um, and this is across from uh, April to December 2020. Um, so due to obviously the, the work that's been undertaken, um, we can uh, report to date that we've prevented um, uh, in the region of 346,000 um, in um, prevented uh, error, fraud and non-compliance. Um, we've recovered in the region of 607,000 um, and we've um, got further recovery action being undertaken um, uh, in the region of 417,000 as well. That is a very much live figure, so it's changing um, um, 
as we as we go forward. Um, in terms of a national, um, comparing that against national um, statistics, um, I feel as if we're ahead of the curve uh, from um, from some um, uh, authorities, and in, in that we um, have been proactive. Um, in the assurance work that we've been undertaking since the delivery of these scheme uh, schemes from um, uh, April, um, and um, that work is continual into 2021 as well as new schemes are being implemented and businesses are being supported. Um, we are um, continually corroborating with other multiple um, lawful, lawful agencies, uh, including the National Investigation Service and um, National um, Anti-Fraud Network, um, sharing intelligence where, um, where applicable to, um, to agencies on, on fraud. Um, and, and this is the, the approach that we wish to take going forward. Um, it's, it's the only way really we can see us effectively pursuing cases um, and also getting ahead of um, uh, patterns and curves in, in fraud. Um, in addition to obviously the work that's been taken in um, supporting local businesses in the grant schemes, um, we've also helped support um, the adults and committees in, in increasing um, their counter fraud function um, and mitigating factors. So basically, it, it, it's an ongoing process to try to embed counter fraud across the organisation. And it's something that's going to happen over time uh, and that we're going to have to work on um, as, as we go forward, um, it, addressing every single area of, of the organisation. And, and work is being undertaken with SWAP on, um, on doing a, a counter fraud risk assessment. Um, uh, as we go in to sort of prioritise those areas. Um, uh, we very much are in the process of um, utilising more technology to help prevent uh, and detect fraud. Um, we are members at the moment of the National Fraud Initiative um, and we are um, in the process of joining further memberships as well as a national collective and I'm also a member of the um, Midlands Fraud Group so I uh, regularly liaise with um, and network with local authorities um, across the, mid the Midlands and we you know we'll um, liaise on um, uh, live intelligence uh, and fraud. Um, as a proactive measure. Um, so I'm hoping that everybody's had a chance to actually um, review and, and look through the reports and I'm happy to have any questions on that but I think I will also go into the strategy before we do. So do, do you want to take um, any questions? I've got one hand oh, up at the moment so um, certainly. it might be useful just to, to take that. Councillor Ginman. Yeah, no, thank you very much uh, for those opening comments, the opportunity just to comment. Uh, I note um, the figures that you've quoted, and I just wondered, well, the break uh, in those figures are, is between COVID-related fraud and non-COVID-related fraud, because we're reading the press, we're all very well aware that there's been quite a lot of publicity about the amount of fraud related to COVID uh, claims, grants, etc., and we also appreciate Tony only too well the immense pressure there is on councils uh, and staff to ensure that grants get put out there to people who and businesses that desperately need it. So I'm just wondering whether the majority of that or part of that or where you see that position. The second question was, you started once answer it, I think, for me in a way, is I wondered if post January the 1st, whether there had been some speculation as to uh, difficulties in, shall we say, engaging with other countries with regard to fraud prevention. And I'm aware that some of the COVID related frauds appear to be international ones of some scale. So I just wonder if that was inhibiting you or you saw that as a problem. Yeah, certainly. Thank you. Um, so so with, with, with the figures that you can see on page 104, I attribute that mainly to COVID related fraud. The reason being is that the business support grants that are being issued are um, in support of the pandemic. Um, so with those schemes being directly linked to the pandemic, um, that's what I've attributed that to um, is, is COVID related fraud. Um, in terms of international efforts, 
we are corroborating with um, the National Investigation Service, with um, police authorities, central government, um, with regards to fraud cases. So on a localised level, we'll be investigating ourselves, uh, uh, but on a national level, we'll be corroborating with um, national agencies who can also update us and, and keep us informed so that we've got the, we can ensure that we've got the resources to, uh, to follow those lines of inquiry if it is on a bigger scale. Thank you for that. Um, I've got uh, Councillor Balderson, but just before um, I go to her, um, could you just explain, um, we've got a total um, perhaps there of 1.37 million on page 104. Um, um, does, does that money go back to Treasury? Does it come back to the council does it come back to the council and then is available to go back out to um proper claimants as it were um I, i'm just just it's a sum of money obviously that comes back from 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 fraudulent or is, can be claimed back from fraudulent activity but I, i'm just trying to understand um uh where it where it sits yes yeah, certainly so um the money once it's recovered some some of these uh, uh, payments are paid in full um, some of them are on repayment schemes um, so they're paid over a period of time in transition um, and it, it comes through to the council and we we obviously report that figure back to um, central government um, um, so that's that's the kind of chain it, it follows it comes through us and goes back You're on Andrew, were you, you wanted to come in. Chair, I'm just going to add to that. As Jonathan has said, that um, this is linked to the money coming from government. Uh, we, we report this back to government. Uh, we will then have a settling up, if that's the right phrase, of um, our position on the grant scheme with government. So government will, in effect, be uh, um, dealing with that issue on there. But so clearly, we'll do everything we can to recover uh, the money's where we can. I, I just I was going to comment on Councillor Jimman's um, point about um, a lot of the fraud activities is around the COVID. Um, frauds does follow the money, sadly. So I, that, that's where, you know, for the last 12 months, there's been a lot of activity. So they followed that. But, you know, before that, we had floods. So um, uh, suddenly the fraud community don't uh, distinguish between the source of money that they just go try and follow the money. <laughs> Just to clarify then, so we're, we're, uh, we obviously have a fiduciary duty to the government um, in respect of funds that we're, um, we're handling on their behalf. And it, it is the investigations work uh, by people like Jonathan under, that, that are being undertaken under that fiduciary duty. Um, even, though, even though the money may not come back and sort of sit on our often loss account as it were but um it, it's part of the um uh, of, of our activity more generally um i've got uh, councillor Balderson, councillor watson and councillor toynbee so i'll let uh, councillor thanks. thanks chair um just um i guess it it is positive that the work that you are doing has achieved or a potential saving of almost 1.4 million so um, so that's a great positive out of it, uh, even if the council doesn't get to keep the money <laughs> or use the money to pay your your uh, uh, employment costs. But um, uh, in terms of, I just wanted one clarification. I know in the Treasury Management Briefing that we had last week, um, I think it was Mr Lovegrove indicated that um, we had received about 150 million in grant funding with about 120 million of that being passed or being passed to affected businesses. So I just wanted to understand how your figures um, on page 104 of um, sort of grants paid to businesses of 62 million, how that sort of fits in, in the context of those numbers that we were told last week. Yes, yeah, certainly. So uh, that, that overall figure would be for a variety of different grant schemes. So this kind of focuses on the, the initial schemes that were, um, that were implemented. So the, the retail, hospitality, leisure, the small business grants and the first discretionary grant schemes. Um, so it's the initial um, reporting. Obviously, there's more assurance work going on, ongoing for those schemes um, and the, the new schemes as well. Um, so I, I, do, I do envision that that figure will develop um, as time goes on. 
Thank you. Councillor Watson, sorry. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks for the report, uh, Jonathan. Um, um, I'm interested in the Heritage Council fraud response flowchart, uh, which is on page 14 of the uh, report. And I'm, I'm looking at where it's got finish um, at the bottom left hand corner of that page. And um, something that I know my colleagues will smile at because my constant two words are, you know, the feedback loops. And where you've got, um, you know, to publicize um, success, underneath it's got consider lessons learned, but it actually sits alone. And I'm just wondering if that can kind of have a feedback loop into, um, management or something else because it's not a standalone is it it's like if you're going to consider it who's going to consider it and um and and to have that kind of linkage that's the one um i would ask for please and the other is and you have to forgive me because i'm going backwards and forwards on my um screen is that um as a member of the audit and governance committee uh we are as you're quite rightly saying, to monitor and oversee this council strategies and policies and then consider the effectiveness um, of these strategies. Um, but I will make it clear to the public that we also rely on like internal audit reports for the effectiveness um, of those strategies. Um, so we also rely on the officers and um, outside agencies to actually give us that data. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Jonathan, did you want to go and, and talk a little bit further about the um, strategy document? Uh, yes, certainly. Thank you. Okay. And thank you for your questions as well. Okay, so um, yeah, so the strategy, um, if I can just locate, it's just after page 107. Um, Brilliant. So the purpose of the strategy was to make um, uh, it, it accessible to the public as well as internal employees within the council. Um, and it was to make it um, visually um, user friendly as well, because uh, any member of the public can then pick it up and, and, and understand it from from their perspective um, as well. You don't have to be um, like myself, a counter fraud specialist to be able to, um, to to understand what our objectives are as an organization. Um, so we first uh, we set our mission statement of um, what our mission and vision, vision and, and purpose is and it, it very much sits on uh, protecting the vulnerable people against the risk of fraud um, and the public funds that go alongside with that um, and, and also just to um, to undertake a corroborative uh, and intelligence led approach so that we we have a structured way of actually dealing with fraud um, and that we we liaise with the relevant authorities as and when required um, uh, to, to, to better resource ourselves um, as well as to protect the funds and, and, and the vulnerable members of the public. Um, so if you proceed to um, from pages um, 1112 to 1113, um, that is the forward and executive summary it basically just sets the tone of the document um, and it's 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 there just to entice the reader to understand what what um, um, what we aim to achieve um, uh, and, and um, what the purposes of the strategy. Um, and then further into that, you've got the um, definitions, um, which um, helps just to explain um, fraud, theft, corruption and bribery. Um, and, and then you've really gone into... A gone into um, the nature and scale of the problem, the true extent, to try to... Um, uh, for the average reader to understand um, what the risk of fraud is um, as a general uh, and, and where it sits within our society as well. Um, uh, and, and that also depicts over the last 30 years. So it just gives you an indication of the true nature and, and, and scale extent of the problem. Um, it, it very much has shown an upward trend 
um, over the last couple of decades, um, especially as technologies developed um, and cybercrime and, and, and uh, methodologies used um, develop and are flexible as well. Um, and then further to that, um, on page 117, um, we talk about the fraud risks to local authorities. Now, this is a gen. I point out this is a, a general um, uh, general fraud risks to local authorities, not just to Herefordshire Council. Um, and this document, that when it does become accessible, um, there will be. Um, um, parts where you can hover over it and it'll explain the certain um, images and, and um, um, graphs on there as well. Um, but the, this kind, what this part does, the, the, uh, the general types of fraud risk across the local authorities, it, it kind of um, shows you the what we're up against um, because fraud is so diverse and it's not just um, uh, in one particular area, you've almost got to rely on the specialist for each part of the organisation uh, and it needs to be a, a collective effort um, to counter fraud. It cannot just be sitting on one um, area. So, you know, you, what you can see here is the various different ways in which fraud can be committed. And these are just examples um, uh, which um, um, uh, pose a risk to local authorities. Um, so the strategy itself has been um, uh, used in best practice on the Fighting Fraud Locally 2020 strategy. Um, so on page 118, uh, we talk about the strategic framework and you can see um, the, there's four pillars on there, which has been taken from that uh, original strategy, and that, that very much focuses on govern, acknowledge, prevent and pursue. Um, with that in place, that, that's the foundation of any good um, counter fraud strategy, and that's what we've adopted in our own um, uh, to, to help us have a, um, a, you know, a collective viewpoint on, on what we want to achieve from the strategy. And then uh, the strategy goes on to uh, explain cooperation. So as you can see from page 119, these are the, the various different um, agencies uh, that we may work with on any given investigation if it's on an organized scale. And it just kind of depicts to, to anybody reading just how complex an investigation can be because, you, you know, you'd be liaising with any one of these, any number of these at any given time. Um, uh, and it, that is the best way to to do a fraud investigation and to uh, to make sure that, you know, we are following all lines of inquiry um, uh, and, and pursuing all avenues. Um, and then uh, again, we go into structure. Um, and I think we mentioned about the responsibility of um, audit and governance committee. This part here going on to page 120, 121, um, it, it explains the uh, the, the specific responsibilities of um, the various positions within that sit within um, the council, including the counter fraud specialist, um, and, and what is expected of those roles. Um, so, really, as time goes on, we really want to be embedding these responsibilities, ensuring that they are monitored and that they are um, uh, effective within the counter fraud function. And then, okay, we got the um, counter fraud um, response flow chart on page 122. Um, I note the point you wanted to make, um, Councillor, on the flow chart finish section, which we can amend. Um, but it, it, again, it should show the, um, the process which would be followed from uh, fraud concern, um, at the various different avenues to the investigation and to the, um, the mitigating risks that would be undertaken at the various points um, and, and the actions taken as well um, in, in, a, in a visual format so that the average reader can understand you know, the various avenues in which a fraud referral will, will take place and go through. Um, that, that we have already started work on um, uh, creating a functional relationship between the counter fraud team and uh, trading standards um, and further work will be undertaken to establish relationships with um, uh, internal human resources as well. Um, so again, it's, it's something that will develop over time. 
Um, moving on from that, you've got the legislation of polic and policies. These are just a few to name of, of the legislation that we adhere to uh, during an investigation uh, and the various policies, internal policies within the council um, that are relevant to, um, to an investigation as well. I think I know, um, if I could just interrupt you at that yep. point, um, it may be useful if we're providing a, a list like this um, uh, and, and appreciating, um, I've just spoken to uh, uh, Mr. Coleman about uh, live links, but actually to have links then to where this legislation may be found um, on the council website rather than just to have a, um, uh, uh, a policy statement and then leave it to um, people to try and work their way through the website to try and find the policy um, in, in preparation there. Um, I think you're about to come under what we seek to deliver and the, the only comment I would have um, and I'd like to kind of make it now is that we've got a, a strategy um, and a strategy that um, I note that both my and uh, my uh, vice chair's name have been put to, um, uh, appreciating that. And then we have sort of an action plan and it wouldn't really be appropriate, I think, for, for, for an action plan, which is really an officer um, in tech led um, act, uh, activity, um, to be signed by the chair of audit and, and governance. Perhaps that action plan needs to come outside um, and be a separate, um, a separate uh, document. Um, I'm just conscious that, that um, we perhaps haven't um, commented on it in, in the draft form in this way, but uh, reflecting on it, I'm uneasy as to where um, where that sits um, and that the, the, uh, the importance of that might be lost on most people, but I think it, 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 it's not, for, it's not for a chairman or a committee to be um, um, uh, signing their name as it were for, for, to a, to the do list um, as I can't do any of these things. Um, I'm monitoring and uh, commenting on um activities of officers in, in, in delivering them. I, I don't know, um, Mr. Lovegrove, if you want to, to or, or Claire, you want to comment on that? I think I, that's a valid point. And I think um, we're happy to take that away and um, revisit that. We need to make the distinction between operational matters and things of policy and your role as the Audit and Governance Committee. So we can take that away and uh, just fine tune that. Uh, thank you. And um, uh, and as a comment on the action plan, I think target dates of ongoing probably don't meet the what I call the smart um, uh, uh, test. Um, so if we have an action, who's who, who's doing it when it's completed by and and, and kind of moving on. Uh, otherwise, it's not really an action. It's it's more of a it's more part of the strategy. I think, um, uh, but um, uh, what I would say is, is it's an excellent, um, uh, an excellent uh, uh, and valuable document in in uh, coalescing all of the activity. Um, and goodness me, isn't there a lot of it um, <laughs> that um, that is to be undertaken? And I suspect some questions might come from committee on on in terms of the. Um, of the extent and the uh, the resource requirements in order to um, uh, tackle all of this. So, um, if I can draw your um, presentation, thank you to a to a conclusion there. I'll just open um, to any other questions from committee members. Uh, Councillor Balderson. Thanks, Chair. I think I, I would um, uh, support everything that you've you've commented on there and. Um, in terms of sign off, whether it's more appropriate for it to be a cabinet member as opposed to an audit committee or, or, or officer um, or leader of the um, council, potentially. Um, my, um, I guess my, the purpose of this report is, if I go back to page one, is to give an annual report on the key risks within the council and how these will be addressed and managed. And I appreciate uh, we probably need to review the strategic document first 
um, to sign off on, on to then get the next steps. But I guess what I'm, I find this quite still um, uh, relatively high level and I appreciate you need to set the scene um, and um, outline the nature and the scale of the problem, but um, it's not very specific to Hereford Council. Um, so not necessarily, um, if, if I go back to the very beginning of the purpose of this, of this document, um, I still, as an audit committee, a member trying to get an assurance over the key risks within the council and how these are being addressed and managed. Um, perhaps uh, uh, I would like to perhaps see a little bit more detail uh, and specifically um, I've got some questions. There's section um, 1.3 um, and section 4.2. So section 1.3 is page 16 or 124 of the pack. So it talks about um, there being an ongoing fraud plan, which is agreed by committee. Is that us or is that a different committee? Um, and also the plan covers the local authority business. So does that include Hoople and our strategic partners? Uh, and you also talk about um, fraud resources would need to be assessed proportionately, which is under, under section 4.2, which is page 19 or 127 of the pack. Um, so, does that mean that there's going to be an increased budget uh, within the internal team? Has that been included in the current budget rounds? So I guess I've got a number of questions in terms of the role of a um, of ANG, similar to the internal audit plan. Would we be looking at a risk assessment and consequential actions to address those risks that are very specific to our council, or is it just a high level, um, you know, this high level document? So that there's some detailed questions and some higher level questions there. Yes, thank, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, the purpose of the report, I, I, I respect and I understand what you were saying regarding the um, a more specific viewpoint onto the council. Um, um, at the moment, we are currently undertaking uh, an organization uh, wide risk assessment with internal audit um, and that will be developed over the coming months um, so what the hope is is that once we've uh, concluded that um, that we can uh, report more specifically um, on, on Heritage Council fraud risks. Um, I thought it would be good just to just to um, to get the strategy out there as a generic strategy um, and also sort of give guidance on, on where we Aim and you know what what we aim to achieve before going into the specifics. Um, I, I also I would have hoped to have uh, that risk assessment done um, uh, before the meeting, but obviously with with the you know the COVID nineteen um, priorities at the moment, that's very much taken a lot of the resource in in, in my function, my role. Um, but it is something we're definitely looking at now, um, and, and hopefully we can look to present in some format to you going forward. Um, just uh, with the ongoing fraud uh, plan, um, again, that is something I would like. I'd like us to uh, have sitting alongside the annual fraud report, so that you can see on an annual basis or, or, or even quarterly basis what we aim to um, prioritise. But that will be based on the fraud risk assessment. So that the aim here is to identify where the risks are within the council with internal audit, and then using that prioritize certain areas and, and, and using our resources to, to target those areas uh, and, and a, a fraud uh, plan will be developed based upon that risk assessment. Um, I wouldn't want to commit to doing a fraud plan just now just because it, fraud is very flexible and changing with COVID-19 um, but it is just something that I wanted to um, just to you know have on the radar for, you, for, for audit. Yeah thank you for that it, the, and I guess along with um, Councillor Shaw's uh, comment on making smart um, sort of um, actions and um, target dates, etc. Um, if we are going to see um, some sort of plan, I think that could be uh, and the regularity of that plan. So, for example, internal audit are moving to a quarterly um, review of their plan instead of an annual review of their plan. So, uh, if you are working so closely with internal audit, are you going to align it? Um, potentially with with their schedule um, uh, so, so that would that would be um, some of those comments but also from a, a resource perspective as well in terms of how do you intend to deliver this plan is it just you 
are there more resources in the budget or are we looking at internal audit days as well to address that? Um, from my, my knowledge so far, having um, spoken with um, with Amy from SWAP, is that it's um, it's an ongoing fraud, counter fraud function that they're developing within SWAP. So um, there hasn't been any allocation of, um, of of days for this particular risk assessment. But um, when when we did uh, speak about it, it was very much a case of um, it's going to have to be monitored as we go forward. Once it's there and we've we've done that risk assessment, it's something that has to be monitored. So that's where we might have to uh, account certain resources to keep that alive um, uh, alive risk assessment. Thank you for that. Um, I think there might be some recommendations coming forward out of um, the sort of comments and um, comments made both by councillors and um, and by officers. Um, I'm not sure whether um, um, our clerk is uh, is is uh, picking up on some of these. I think um, the the recommendation that currently in the report uh, in the uh, action says that uh, we determine any recommendation we make wish to make to ensure the anti fraud work is maximised. Um, but I think in terms of the review of the report, perhaps we're also making some recommendations in terms of the report structure. Um, and the uh, following on from Johnson Nelson's comments, um, the the way that action plans are brought forward to to uh, relate to uh, quarterly updates from internal audit would be something that I think committee would recommend that um, you considered. Um, and I'm not sure if I've. If, if I think a bit more while Councillor Watson asks her question, uh, I might be able to um, uh, put some words to some more recommendations. Councillor Watson. Well, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, my question is related to um, page 117 in the report. Um, and uh, it's about the, what types of fraud risk are there for local authorities? I think, um, and that's on page nine of the actual annual report. Um, something that I thought was missing was uh, theft because um, in our last meeting, um, SWAP brought to our attention of monies that was taken um, from a safe. And, um, and that's a specific example. Um, and I just, um, I'm just wondering why theft isn't, because um, often some officers, like in children and families, are given um, uh, personal items to hold, uh, which in this case was some money. Um, thankfully, the, the family didn't lose out on that money. But I'm very conscious as that is a specific case for Heritage Council and assurance that it won't happen again, I suppose. Sorry, Chair. I think I'm having difficulties with my internet. I didn't. Okay. I, didn't I didn't quite catch um, the majority of that. Uh, Chair, I could answer that if, if that helps. On there, um, on the the table of internal fraud, um, on the left hand side, we do have stealing cash as one of the items. Sorry, it's buried in the detail, but we so uh, we have got theft in there on that point. Theft of cash. Okay. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, uh, Councillor Jinman. Yeah, if I could just follow on from that um, comment that's just been made. It, it, in your opening of the whole thing, you, you define what is fraud, corruption, theft and bribery. And the, the predominant part of this is all dealing with fraud. Um, and correct, um, some comment about corruption, as has just been made, there's a question mark about theft, but not a lot about bribery. Um, and I just wonder if that needs referencing, as you put it in there, it needs referencing to some other document within the council uh, that is already in place or should be in place so that people can see reference to both of those. I mean, they're both very important points. And if I may, while I'm just uh, looking at this, the, um, the comment that you were making about signing it off uh, earlier on uh, and putting your name to it, 
I think it was on page one, two, three, where legislation and policy says this strategy outlines that the council are fully compliant with the relevant legislative requirements. I, as it says in the yes minister, it's a very brave comment to say you're fully compliant. I think you're attempting to achieve full compliance or working towards full compliance or cognizant of it. Um, but um, if this is going to be signed off, the committee is saying that we are actually fully compliant. Well, I'm very pleased to hear it, um, but I think I might need to do a lot more uh, detailed consideration of uh, uh, certain actions and activities. I appreciate that you're putting the right things in place to ensure compliance. It just makes me slightly nervous that we're actually saying as a committee that we're ensuring that it, that it is fully compliant. No, I know, I know your points, thank you. Right, um, sorry, um, Councillor Balderson, could you just take over the chair for a moment? I, I pressing matter I need to uh, attend to. Certainly right. no problem. Yeah, just just, no problems, just for, for a couple of minutes. Uh, do we have any further questions or should we, um, Caroline, are you able to perhaps summarise some of the, the discussions that we've been having? Uh, unfortunately, my connection did drop out um, <laughs> very slightly, so I may not have got all of the recommendations, but I think I've got the majority of them. Okay, so, if we walk through each one and then if the committee believes that we've, we've missed some off, we'll, we'll have some time at the end. Uh, the flow chart in the strategy be amended to include a lessons learnt feedback to management. Within the strategy to include links to relevant sections of the council website or relevant national document where required. The role of the committee in connection with the strategy and the action plan to be split out. Quarterly updates to the committee be considered. I have one query in as much as it is a function of this committee to approve this strategy. Is the committee prepared to approve it at this stage or do you require it to come back once all the amendments have been made that you've requested? Uh, are, are, there, are there any further recommendations that you've got first, Caroline, before we, we make that decision? I haven't. Like I said, my connection did drop out drop very out. slightly. So I are, there, are, are there any other um, things that ha you believe need to be captured as recommendations? Or we've got Councillor Toynbee. Um, yes, uh, I was just going to go back to what um, Councillor Ginman said, um, his final comment about, you know, what what we actually signing off in, in terms of, you know, we a statement that says we are compliant, but I can't, rem I can't remember where that is. Um, presumably that's in the, wh whereabouts is that, but I think um, maybe Caroline missed that, but I expect the recommendation that could come out of that. Yeah, it's one, two, three page top of it, legislation and policy, this strategy outlines that the council are fully compliant. So the wording around that and uh, the responsible party that really should be signing off on a um, working document as such. So I think there perhaps needs to be a split between the, the overall governance element, uh, which is what is the responsibility of audit and governance, and then the operational element. Any other elements that were discussed that you don't believe have been captured? Are you back with us, Councillor Shaw? I, I'm shall back I, with you when, when, when you want, when you want me to. <laughs> <laughs> We've just gone through the uh, recommendations and then the clerk have asked us whether we are confident to sign it off with those recommendations or whether we require further changes to the document and for it to come back to us at a, I, at a I later think, stage. Um, I think, personally, I would prefer the document to come back to us. I think I think it's not just a, uh, to some extent, there's some minor changes can be made, but I think um, the, the structure, because the structure of the document just needs to be changed a bit, I'd, I'd like to have the opportunity to uh, quickly review it uh, in a, slightly different format um and uh given given 
the importance of that. Um, I don't think we're under any time constraints on this. Um, looking at uh, Caroline or um, Claire, no. Uh, so if we have the time available to us, uh, I appreciate it's, it's a, yet another agenda item to come at a, f a future meeting, but I, I think um, it could be dealt with quite quickly um, at a future meeting, but I do think uh, I recommend to committee that um, we, we we ask it to come back um, with the uh, with the, with the various amendments uh, made. Um, I I see nodding nodding heads. I don't know if I have to ask uh, for for a vote on that, but I think uh, I think I see a lot of nodding heads and no no shaking heads on that. Um, so that's where we are. Uh, Caroline, do we have some? We've, we've, you've read out the recommendations that we're making. I don't think there's anything else we need to add to that, apart from that we're recommending that the document comes back to us um, uh, when it's been uh, uh, amended um, and developed a bit further. Um, can I take it that we could go to a vote at this time? Yep. Yes, Chair, you can. Thank you. Six voting members, Chair, and we're just waiting for the non-voting members to leave. Okay, the poll should be on your screen. All votes are in, Chair, and those, been, uh, those have been unanimously accepted. Thank you. Um, so could I ask um, those in the waiting room now to be readmitted? Thank you. And... Um, Thank you, Jonathan, for, for that report. And uh, it's by, by no means no criticism at all of, of officers um, that um, uh, we're, we're sort of asking for this to come back again. I, th I think it, it, it's hugely difficult um, to create a, a sort of a new new report. And um, um, it's only actually after a lot of ongoing consideration do we do we start to um, see between the, the the trees within it um, and um, reflect on on some of those things. So I think it'll come back as a much, uh, 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 with a, just a little bit of work as a, a much, much better document and something that can be built on. And, and we look forward to to hearing from you in future and, and to working uh, uh, with us to, to, to build on this uh, going forward. And um, uh, well done on uh, on all the money you've, you've You've, you've located so far and uh, we, we look forward to that total uh, well we don't look forward to the total increase but we look forward to you to, to you, you uh, giving us uh, even better assurance that uh, we're uh, we're not uh, uh, letting uh, public money uh, slip through our fingers to 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 the fraudsters that unfortunately have are prevalent and have been even more prevalent uh, during this uh, this period of, of COVID. And I understand, um, you know, from from work done um, from SWAP, uh, they've been pointing out some uh, issues that other councils have had with uh, with things like uh, 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 a banking fraud and and all sorts of things there. So uh, thank you for that. I'm going to take uh, suggest a five minute um, break now, so that we come back at uh, 25 past 12 to take uh, the uh, uh, update to con finance and contract procedure rules item uh, 11 in the agenda. Thank you.
So um, I think we're just waiting um, for one or two people to uh, switch their video uh, back on. Um, I'll start to introduce. Um, so we're going to now go through agenda item 11, the update to the finance and contract procedure rules. Um, presenting officers here will be Rosalie Schultz, the head of corporate services, contract procedure rules, Andrew Lovegrove for the financial procedure rules. Um, and we'd also, we'll also welcome uh, Councillor uh, Gemma Davis, uh, the cabinet member for commissioning procurement and assets um, and uh, welcome her uh, comments and uh, uh, on uh, on the presentation as as it goes um, just to remind uh, members of the committee and any public listening the purposes of uh, this item is to for us to as a committee to approve the updates the contract procedure rules at appendix two of the report, the financial procedure rules attached to Appendix 4 and the finance producer rules guidance notes attached to Appendix 6. And the rules were last updated and approved by the committee in January 2020. Now, appreciating there's an awful lot of, uh, of documentation here um, and we have a limited time uh, at our disposal this morning to um, to discuss these matters. So if I could ask everybody to be uh, focused um, on, uh, on on the important points as, as best they can and, uh, and we'll deal with the, uh, the process. So um, I don't know who's wanting to uh, kick off first, whether it's uh, whether it's contract procedure or financial procedure, I'm not sure who has the priority um, between the, the two of you. Um, would somebody like to begin? Um, well, well, Chair, could I suggest that um, uh, due to the time pressures, probably the best use of time, if we open it up for questions and queries, and, um, we could talk at length about the various changes, but they may not be the things that are interesting the committee. If, that, if that's a way forward. I, I think that, that that's admirable, but um, perhaps I could just ask you and um, and uh, uh, Rosalie just to outline what you see as the major changes um, uh, that have come about as a result of changing policy. Certainly. I, I, if, if, if I go first with finance, if, if that um, helps on that. And I think this is um, an evolution process rather than a radical change uh, a process on the, certainly the financial procedure rules. It's very much um, fine tuning how we deal with things. So we've got items in there about confirming that we get red book valuations for asset purchases uh, and the like. Um, we're proposing a, um, that that then is just uh, baked in to the arrangements along with items such as the um, processes for creating and so new posts on there. That is a large um, cost element of the councils just to bring some clarity in there. And the other item um, I think is probably the uh, the changes is about how we deal with external funding process, uh, grant applications and the like. Uh, there are other changes in paragraph three uh, about bringing uh, greater clarity and transparency around underspends and the like. Thank you. Um, yes, perhaps, um, well, I, I, can I ask a question? Well, I can ask a question, can't I? Sir? Um, uh, paragraph 3H on page 131 um, talks about new paragraph 94 to confirm leases must be less on commercial trading terms and not a waive cost in award of contract. Um, what does that mean? And this is picking up in um, Grant Thornton, uh, John and Gail from Grant Thornton touched on this and commercial activity is a significant uh, area of interest for audit. Now we have very limited exposure to this compared to other councils, but this is where we have an arrangement where uh, in effect we award a contract for a service to be provided to the council and sometimes some councils say well actually we'll provide you a building for free of charge or a property. And it gets quite difficult to understand that, that transaction. So this is bringing that to, into greater clarity so there would be a lease so we can see the quantum. 
it also enables people who are bidding for our work to have a um, a choice about whether they use our premises or find their own premises. So thank you. Um, Councillor Toynbee. Yes, um, thank you. Yeah, as we're getting straight into questions, I've, I've got a rather, <laughs> um, a, a rather uh, general one. Um, as we've all seen, there are a lot of changes to track here. There's an awful lot of red and it was just updated just a year ago. So, um, so I understand that the reasons for all these changes are a blend of recommendations from SWAP, the fact that we have a new administration and um, Brexit. So I'd just be interested to know if, if it's possible to give us an idea of um, what, what are the, is it, is it possible in layperson's terms to explain what the sort of changes we have to make are in relation to national legislation because of Brexit and how much of these changes are related to that as opposed to our internal decisions? Um. Chair, I think that um, those changes, it's probably more in the, the contract area than the finance ones. So, Rosalie, are you able to, to help in there? Yes, of course. Thank you. Um, so the, the changes in relation to the EU exit predominantly uh, relate to a change, I suppose, in the location of where any tenders, um, public sector tenders are published and advertised. So as we've exited the European Union, um, we no longer, we're no longer required to publish our tenders on the journal on the European Union Journal, um, often referred to as OJU. So we can now publish them. A local platform has been developed basically through which we can publish those um, tenders. Specific changes in relation to the EU exit are still being developed. There is a recent um, green paper that's been published outlining uh, and seeking consultation really on um, areas in which procurement itself can be progressed and um, developed to benefit the United Kingdom. Um, but in practice, those haven't come into play just yet. Okay, thank you. So if, the, if there's anything really substantial um, that, that you'll let us know, you'll keep us updated with that. Yes, absolutely, yes. Thank you. Um, uh, just because it's uh, Councillor Watson and uh, Councillor Boulders and Councillor Watson got their hands up, um, but. I just wanted to expand Councillor Toynbee's question a little bit. In in terms of the, we, we, all, we all got used over the last 40 years to EU um, tendering regulations and the threshold um, at which you had to go to OJU. Um, is there a threshold um, for uh, having to uh, publish on this new um, uh, uh, um, open sort of tendering? Uh, process or, or or is that up to each individual the decision maker to take? At the moment the thresholds remain the same um, so there is a, a threshold um, well in terms of in relation to the public contract regulations where tenders do have to be published openly for national well now national competition um, and they've remained the same so 189,000 pounds for contracts um, for services and goods contracts um, 7.4 million for works contracts and uh, 663,000 um, for social care and health contracts. No. Uh, and are those, those are that those thresholds of figures which have, have, have directly related to the uh, euro equivalents in the EU. Right. <laughs> so so we. we all's changed yet nothing's changed apart from the fact that this this isn't an, a, a European wide um, call. Yes, in terms of the legal requirements, yes. Yeah, and uh, just to satisfy my own curiosity, are the are the quantums defined in euros or are they defined in in sterling? Sterling currently. Sterling currently. Okay, thank you. Uh, right. Sorry, uh, Councillor Balderson. Thanks, Chair. My, um, I have questions on both the contract procedurals and uh, the financial procedurals. If I start with the financial ones, um, just one quick question. The accountable body status, which is discussed on page 195 of the report pack, um, indicates that approval must be obtained by the relevant cabinet member and full council. So I just wanted to understand whether this would require a constitutional amendment because when I looked at part three, section one council functions, there wasn't any reference to accountable bodies within that. So that might be a question to um, 
Claire Ward, perhaps. Um, it will mean a change in itself. So we're deciding kind of under local choice functions that this will go now to full council. So we so would need to make... No, because it's these these guidances, these rules are already part of the constitution. Okay, where which part? Where would I go to see that? So that will I'm be putting you on the spot. Now. Sorry, this is in the finance procedurals. So if it's in the finance procedurals, that is part of the constitution. Do you see oh, what okay. I mean? So you don't need to change it anywhere else. Oh, okay, okay, I understand that. Thank you. And then my. Are you taking questions, Chair, on the contract procedure rules now, or were you going to? I think if you've got a question, um, let, 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 let's take the questions, and okay. um, and we'll we'll see where we go from there. Uh, so I can see that um, well, there's a number of questions, but um, I, I can see in the summary report the key reasons for some of these changes, and one of those is to due to internal audits review on contract management and their suggested changes. So I guess I wanted to put back, um, I guess if we're if we're signing it off, uh, can Jackie uh, Gooding provide some level of assurance as to whether she thinks that they've appropriately addressed all the recommendations with their changes? Jackie, can you come back on that? Yes, certainly. Thank you, Councillor Bolson. Yes, obviously all the recommendations that we've made over, over a number of audit reports, which you will have, have obviously seen, and you would have seen those high priority recommendations as they would have come to you as a committee. The changes to the financial procedure rules, and in particular the contract procedure rules, have been made to reflect those recommendations. So I have confidence in the changes that have been made that should provide better clarity around um, the the issues that we've raised previously in relation, particularly in relation to procurements. Fabulous. I appreciate that. Thank you. And then my other question was really around the increasing the low value contract threshold from 5,000 to 25,000. So I just wanted to gain a better understanding as to why uh, 25,000 was deemed the appropriate value and also better understanding the risks associated with that. So I see in the report, um, the risk associated with it was that the use of e-procurement system will no longer be mandatory, minimizing management information. Um, but I didn't, I didn't, I didn't fully understand whether that was the only risk to increasing it to 25,000 or, or fully appreciate what, what that risk was trying to, to communicate. So, so why 25K? And if, if there can be further explanations out around the, the risks of increasing it to 25K, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so the reason for 25K, we've been doing quite a lot of work in the last nine months, I would say, so during the course of the pandemic, um, to improve how we engage with smaller organizations, local organizations, and also to develop our social value um, um, approach really when it comes to in, in, encompassing social value in tenders. Um, the, the, a lot of feedback we had from the supply chain when we undertook surveys was that our procurement processes were sometimes quite difficult and cumbersome for smaller, for smaller organizations to participate in. So Her Herefordshire inherently has a lot of um, SME um, and ch ch charity organizations. Um, they're, they're, they are small scale. They don't necessarily have as many bid teams as larger organizations would have. So um, a more sort of informal approach to uh, enabling competition and the council being able to evidence best value seemed appropriate. We also, um, I am a member of the West Midlands procurement, heads of procurement group. Um, and we also just did an analysis of our members within that group, but also uh, around the country to understand where their low value thresholds were. And I think it's fair to say most were already hitting 10K to 15K. Um, others were challenging £30,000 um, and looking to increase that further in order to support local and smaller organisations participate in sort of competitions, um, what, enabling sort of inf an informal approach um, to evidencing best value, um, whilst sort of, we're sort of as contract values in increased, taking on a more formal approach to tendering, so having a more competitive formal uh, procurement process. Um, and those were the reasons for increasing that. Yes. So your e-procurement system is, is quite cumbersome for the smaller um, organisations. So taking them out of having to, to 
uh, meet the hurdles within that, you're hoping will will provide greater social value. Um, and I guess the question then extrapolating, it's great that you've been able to do some, some best practice in terms of what other um, councils are doing. Um, have you extrapolated that across, um, uh, I guess, our contract base in terms of if we increase it from 5K to 25K, do we know what impact or how, how many contracts that, that would capture? And are we going to be adding, you know, the social value that we would want to achieve? Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> so we have done some analysis on that. We have found that there are significant proportion of contracts are above 25 um, K, which for us, I think, minimized the risk around, um, I suppose, more uh, not needing to run a formal competition and um, uh, enabled us to sort of promote, I suppose, as, as a start, um, the use of um, officers being able to undertake these procurements independently um, whilst obtaining competitive quotes in the process, in, albeit informal. Um, I think this is a start to something that we're trying to move forward on and progress. Um, so we are, we've also been quite conscious of doing something a bit more drastic or increasing it to say 50 at this stage. Um, I think the important thing is trying to understand what our market is as a next phase. So specifically what does the Herefordshire market look like in terms of smaller businesses, charities and um, uh, social enterprise organizations before we do anything too significant above the 5,000 pounds threshold. Okay, so where you said in your risk that there'll be spot checks and internal audit will be carrying out retrospective work, you will be actively monitoring this over the next 12 months to see whether you've got the 25k level right and it might be when you next come to us next year, there, there may be some reflection within that. Yes, that's correct. We've also made a change um, to our, um, I think the retrospective element was linked also very much to contract management um, and contract recording on the register. So whilst the tender process uh, we're now saying is not mandatory to, to facilitate through the e portal, we will be capturing this information through our contract management and contract register, which currently still requires all contracts above that £5,000 to be recorded. So in terms of at the point at which contracts are award, awarded, um, we will have that data and monitor it that way. Um, linking uh, to spend, so we will also be linking our contracts, uh, so transactions actually. So financial transactions will be linked to contract um, records as well, so that we can see exactly how um, spend aligns to the contracts that we have on, on the system. Thank you. Thank you. Just before I come to Councillor Watson, I just wanted to um, add on a question to what uh, to, to, to the issue that Councillor Balderson raised. Is there then a process of monitoring um, um, multiple low value contracts? Um, I've, I've, I've seen instances where um, in order to, uh, shall we say, circumvent um, uh, pro process, um, we find multiple low value contracts um, uh, put through to uh, one or two suppliers. Um, and and is, that, is that something that will be picked up by the monitoring process that you're proposing? Yes, it will. And I think the approach we're taking now linked register to spend in business world is what's given us the assurance to take this step in fact to, to, to raise the threshold to 25k. Um, we've also included um, a mandatory training module proportionate now to offices that do undertake procurement activity or contract management activity which specifically um, highlights the need to well the rule not to disaggregate contracts in order to circumvent um, contract um, or contract procedurals. Um, and I think an, another reason why we've tried to keep the threshold at 25k is to minimize the risk around multiple orders quickly accumulating to legally required thresholds. So um, I think this is a, a, a reasonable start without introducing too much risk for the authority. And again, presuming you'll be monitoring spend by, by supplier as well. Yes, yes that's right. correct. Because um, I don't know how those how that rule might determine might might lead you up to um, uh, thresholds 
potentially, I suppose, um, at least for uh, for, for um, uh, tendering process. Anyway, um, Councillor Watson. Uh, thank you, Chair. My question um, is around context because it's, it might be a silly question, but where does the original document come from? Is it an off-the-shelf document around finance rules that you then adapt for a local council? And where does, you know, or is it an original document that's actually written by Heritage Council officers around financial rules? And uh, that's around Appendix 5 and 6. So that might be initially for um, uh, for Andrew to, to to comment on in terms of the finance uh, rules area. Um, oh. Is this a SIPFA derived document or, or is this uh, uh, a work of fiction of, <laughs> of the finance department? Um, uh, it's uh, SIPFA and the various schools say that we need to have an appropriate uh, scheme of financial procedure rules. Uh, they don't give us a model answer as such because each council is different and each council has its own set of processes. So um, whilst there are you know, examples of good practice out there uh, from other councils, other organisations and CIFA that we don't have a prescribed version. So I, what you see is an evolution of a document that uh, has been in place with the council for a considerable amount of time and it gets evolved through various situations. This annual review process is, is a good example of that. So it is very much a Herefordshire document. I'm sure if we were to dive into our archives, presumably when, you know, in 1998, when we split from the previous arrangements, we probably used the version that was used by the old structure and we've just evolved it over time. But very much it is a bespoke document that is designed to fit this council and the way that this council does business and, and its size and, and all of those arrangements. Oh, that's really interesting. Thank you. Rosalie, did you want to comment on the on the contract um, rules aspect of this document? Does it does this does this conform to any um, um, you know um, it, it, recommendations from um, contract standards bodies? Um, so yes, it does, and also the uh, legal requirements and I suppose best practice around being able to evidence value for money through competition. Um, where we've introduced competition requirements for below um, UK threshold contracts. Um, I think it does vary um, above, um, above the, the threshold. Um, I think the law clarifies what's required. Be below the thresholds, it does vary um, by organization based on the types of risks or issues and, or requirements that, or opportunities that they are um, seeking to obtain. Um, the changes we have made are often um, reviewed and considered um, amongst or in comparison to other what other local authorities are doing as well and certainly with the contract management toolkit that we've, we've developed and the standards that we're trying to introduce at the moment those are based on best practice standards in terms of um, what good contract management activity is based on your contract value and contract risk um, recognizing of course that officers would be technically um, skilled in managing contracts around the subject matter of the contracts that they do manage. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Sorry, no. And it it also aligns to a policy that comes from um, the um, um, cabinet office. So um, I think one that I did reserve to bring to your attention was the reservation of contracts for local suppliers for be for below threshold, but for local suppliers and also um, voluntary community and social enterprise sector which is a new policy that was published in December. Um, and it's just to, to make um, the committee aware that it is a new policy. It has come up to some challenge in terms of media. Um, and whilst it's a positive move, move for smaller organizations and local providers, it is one that we are exploring and continue to, continuing to monitor um, in, uh, in, in terms of its evolution currently. Um, but we felt it was quite important to include as it supports our current ambitions to support our local providers and SME. Good, thank you. Uh, Councillor Jinman, uh, you've got your hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, there's a lot of red ink in this and um, trying to read one's way through all the different bits of that quickly is quite, um, uh, 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 quite difficult. Can I, 
just pick up on exemptions and waivers. Are waivers, um, is it the same officer who's granting the, or the same level of person who will be granting the waiver in a contract as the person who's agreeing the contract? Or does that need a separate person to agree it? Yes, it does need a se separate person to agree it. So the waiver process, um, the uh, officer responsible for uh, delivering the task or requesting the waiver is required to put a case forward for the waiver. The waiver is then reviewed um, by legal services, commercial services, as well as finance, and then signed off by the responsible director or assistant director. Thank you. And where you've got multiple contracts, they may not add up to 25,000, they may not add up to 75,000 per se, but if the holding company is the same company that is actually contracting for two, three, four, each of up to that value, does that constitute then a sort of groupage which would trigger then a higher level of authority? Or do you take the individual company that you might be contracting with in its own right, rather than the holding company that might uh, actually be the beneficiary of multiple contracts? I'd say currently it's the, 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 the company that is actually bidding for the work rather than the holding um, company. So it's the legal entity that is submitted as part of the bid process that we would monitor um, or contract with in that case. That does open up the possibility then that a particular large company could be the multiple receiver of a lot of contracts of small amounts and each of those would not be in itself, not due the same scrutiny as if it was deemed to be one large contract just divided between different servicing uh, companies that they might hold. And um, I'd probably defer to my legal colleagues on that one, but um, I don't believe currently that we can at least prevent um, uh, legal entities in their own right from participating because they're associated to a larger organization in that way. Um, I think if they're an established independent organization, they have every right to participate in that process and be treated um, fairly as would any other organization um, you know, considered an entity in the same rate. Thank you. That, that, that's an interesting, um, it's an interesting angle, isn't it? Um, could I ask a question on page 145, I'm, I'm looking at anyway, but for the procedure rules, um, paragraph 6.25, contracts can be signed by the authorised officer set out in... <sighs> Well, I think I think the the, the text here needs some um, needs uh, clarification a little bit. However, con however, contracts must be executed as deeds by fixing the common seal. I, I just wanted to ask about um, contracts under deed and um, and uh, and outside of deed. Could you could you just confirm why we sign contracts under deed? simple contracts by signature uh, unless that's one for for, for legal <laughs> yes so, some are required by law and some are actually required under our constitution so we decide that is the best um, way of dealing with it because obviously under deed you have longer limitation periods etc yep uh, I agree with that um, but have we uh, as an organization ever questioned what we've got in our constitution in regards to that and in regards to evolving best practice um, as as commercial um, uh, practice has, has obviously changed over the years. It was thoroughly reviewed that um, section on page um, it's just the top of page 146 was definitely reviewed at the last time um, because it's been a full review I presume that has been I haven't personally undertaken it but I presume that has been um, 
reviewed again and what you'll see on a number of them as they have unless agreed otherwise by legal services so we do include that flexibility depending on the circumstance of the actual case thank you yep okay um any other questions from anybody uh councillor jinman yeah apologies yes i've still got uh, another couple um i note in 4615 which is on page 143 there is an absolute which is that when engaging potential suppliers council must not seek or accept this is always very difficult where the technical knowledge is very limited it, in making it an absolute, um, I just wonder if that creates a difficulty in its own right, rather than, uh, or does the exemption clause further down, which allows um, opportunity to vary some of these items, does that cover that? Rosalie, would you be able sorry. to answer that? Yes, yeah, sorry, it's a fairly technical, uh, getting into the nitty gritty of uh, of the document, but um, can you come back I on that? It, yes, of course, and thank you for the question. It is a, it, it, they, they are very much appreciated. Um, it is an, I think there is a, there's, an, there's an element of being able to evidence fairness um, and transparency in undertaking uh, tenders and procurements, particularly for those above, above threshold. And I think it's it's always a challenge for any organization to manage um, the um, bias around potentially um, engaging subject matter expertise in supporting the development of technical specifications and then tendering that same specification for other organizations to, to bid for within a limited amount of time, knowing that the body that may have supported the development of that were fully involved in shaping what that requirement was. So there's the risk of prior knowledge that would distort competition. Um, the exemptions process could be used um, for, for that, but I think the risk then re re resides with the authority to evidence that um, the, the organizations that supported that process in the first place uh, would not be at an advantage. And I think that would be a fairly um, challenging um, risk to manage or explain. Um, the best, better practice thing to do would be to outline in your initial tender where you are seeking support from an organization to shape what your tender might look like, um, is to clarify that they may not be part, you know, they may be exempt from participating subsequently because of the nature of the contract or the support that they're providing. Yeah, I, I appreciate the point and I also appreciate the difficulty. The, the, the point comes particularly where we're dealing with leading edge um, items and that comes both in IT and now increasingly in being carbon aware in the technologies that are going to be required in building, uh, in design and so on. And sometimes those are not evenly shared or known in terms of the knowledge base. And I know in the past there have been great difficulties for some companies not bidding on the grounds that they wanted to have provided advice in the first place because it was clear from the nature of the tender that it needed advice. Uh, so having a means of coping with that seems to me to be something that we need to think through uh, such that we, we don't lose out on best advice when putting forward a tender uh, at the risk of... Um, unfortunately skewing or being accused of ultimately uh, uh, having a, a, a tendering process that's not fit for purpose. So I, I just think there's a, an area here because of the speed of change, because of the speed of technology and uh, requirements that are flowing on it, that we need to have that in consideration somewhere. It may be a piece of work just to do on the back of this, but uh, it seems to me it's a potential of limitation of getting best advice. Thank you, Councillor Jinman. I, I'll take your, um, I do take your uh, concerns on board. So we, that is something I'll take away to look at. What we do encourage as well, just to, to I suppose, uh, help with that process is pre-market engagement um, in order for, I suppose, interested suppliers to, to participate in discussions around what um, our requirements or help inform 
what um, and how technologies have moved forward and evolved. But I think you know it's important for us to recognize that in some cases, the, the level of input that we might require and expertise we might require might come at a cost. So do take your points on board, thank you. Can I, at the opposite end of the scale, make the comment that I note that we need four tenders, etc. Just from local parish council work, actually the opportunity to find enough people to come forward and tender seems to be increasingly difficult. And I hope that the constraint that's being placed by these and the timeline that will be related to that constraint doesn't actually slow up the process of the work. There is often a complaint sometimes from uh, suppliers that the council seems to take an awful long time to make up its mind. And I have a feeling that trying to get four quotes in may in itself be part of the, part of the problem, but I appreciate the importance of trying to get best value and particularly, I think, of getting uh, local uh, people to uh, contract and I, you know we don't want to do anything to discourage that and sometimes the timelines for that are perhaps the locals can do it a bit quicker than some of the those are a bit further away. Thank you. Did, did you want to comment on that uh, at all? Um, so it's always been a problem I think when you when you've got requirements for numbers of tenders and uh, and you can't you can't find people to to do to give you the tenders um and i'm presuming that, that there must be a process by which you know if you can't get four tenders um is is there a process by which uh an exemption is made yes there are two options with that and and the challenges that have been highlighted are exactly that so in raising the thresholds for competitions from 5 to 25k we hope that will alleviate in some way that pressure as well in increasing the number of quotes required we hope that will enable officers to think a little bit differently about widening this the scope of um, suppliers they invite to participate in in competitions um, so that we can support local SMEs and just excuse the noise in the background and um, uh, um, smaller organizations um, the waiver process is in place to support that so in the event there's there's two elements to that so um, if if um, suppliers can't be identified, then the competition can be advertised more openly and to widen that net. Alternatively, a waiver can be sought, but it would be the officer's responsibility to, to explain and evidence why they were on it, you know, what the limitations were around being able to comply with that rule. Thank you. Um, I've just got one, one final question. On page 147, um, 4.6.40, um, it states uh, all contracts over £5,000 are to be entered on the council's contract register by the contract holder in order to comply with the transparency information stroke code. Um, the council's contract register, um, where, where is that found? Where, where are there links to that? And is it a publicly available document? Yes, so the register is, um, is in business world currently and um, an extract of that register is published on a quarterly basis and is available via the council's web website. Um, it is right, it's, a, it's available through the council's website. website. Um, I just, well, I'll, we'll have a go at uh, trying to find it through that route uh, later and um, report back as it were. Um, it's just a matter of, uh, is it probably a matter of comment that, that, that often we refer to documents um, like this but we don't really give a give it give anybody reading um this document any idea as to to where they might find it so so perhaps enhancing that comment by saying which is published on the council's website on a quarterly basis um uh i, I appreciate it. it this is very much a document probably for internal use um but uh, it, it provides a, a, a link and a, a, an opportunity for, for those looking for uh, the information to find it. Um, do we have any more comments? If not, I don't think we've got, um, well, I don't think, has, have we picked up any recommendations at all? At least that, that are... Uh, I have one potential one, right. which is work to be undertaken in 
work to be undertaken to inform the obtaining of advice with regard to the development of a specification from a specialist and where the tender process may prevent that specialist from bidding for the work because they assisted in the development of the specification. I think I know what you mean. Yeah, <laughs> I will um, work on the wording to make it more smarter. But yeah, th thank you. And perhaps in in conjunction with, um, with 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 Rosalie can perhaps input into into that. I, I think I think she, I think we, she explained that there was a there was a process for pre um, pre pre uh, pre procurement um, consultation, but I suspect. Um, and it's always a problem when you're interested in a product as to when you actually sort of call a halt in in in, in correspondence and go to a formal pre-contract um, uh, pre-procurement um, consultation as to as to it not being an informal process with a with a potential supplier. Um, and I, I know that's because I've been in that situation um, where um, procurement are saying uh, effectively, no, you can't talk to them anymore. <laughs> uh, but but you you know you've got deadlines and timelines to, to to develop. So perhaps we could just look at that. Um, that being the only recommendation, can I perhaps now call for the vote? Councillor oh, so Shaw. Councillor Davis, Davis, sorry, do beg your pardon. Um, you wanting to 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 just uh, comment on our discussion there? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes, that's fine. Yes, well, um, yeah, thanks for indulging me on that. I, I was just going to say that I think it'd be really helpful if you did look into that particular issue, because I can think of one scenario in the last three months where whereby somebody has been excluded for bidding for quite a substantial contract because they gave the technical advice in the beginning. So I think it's also about how do we make that that company aware that they are going to be restricted as well. So that's the other side of it. So I think it could be really, really helpful. So I would welcome a piece of work on that. Thank you for that, um, Councillor Davis. Yeah, okay. Um, so can we now move to the vote? There are six voting members, Chair. We're just waiting for the non-voting members to move out of the room. Okay, Chair, those have been approved unanimously. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know whether uh, there might be some people still in the waiting room coming back in for the last, it last item. Um, thank you. Uh, the recommendation was approved. So um, hopefully some work can be done on, um, on uh, pre-contract um, uh, negotiation and advice. Um, moving on then to agenda item 12, the work program update. And I don't know, um, I'll speak if uh, um, Caroline, um, is there anything to be commented on here? Uh, not at this stage, except to note that an additional meeting of the committee has been put in for the 24th of February to accommodate the statement of accounts and associated reports, if they're ready. Thank you. And do we have any other business we're taking at that meeting? No, we don't, Chair. There were okay. due to be two other reports, but they have now been moved on to um, either the March or the May committee. So we'll... Um... That's that's fine. We'll uh, have some time then to to look at the statement accounts in some detail. And I understand um, 
that uh, Mr. Lovegrove or his department might be providing us with some uh, 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 a training stroke briefing on statement of accounts prior to that. Um, so, uh, is a requirement to take a vote on the work programme, Caroline? Uh, a poll is set up for you just to approve the work programme, but if you're happy with it because there's no changes, if that's fine. I think we are. Um, I don't think there's any necessity to, 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 to take a formal vote on that. Um, in which case, then, I announce the date of the next meeting as um, the 24th of February 2021 at 10.15am. I thank everyone for their attendance to this meeting, um, and especially... Um, my committee members and uh, the officers, both of the council and external, who've um, who've uh, attended and contributed, and um, uh, I look forward to uh, uh, seeing you again uh, in the very near future. Uh, can I, before I formally close this meeting, can I check with the Democratic Services team that the live stream has been switched off, and we're no longer broadcasting live or.